BBC Three Counties Radio. It's Wednesday, the 10th of October. I know it's Wednesday, the 10th of October, because I'm going to buy some slippers today. I know, uh, rock and roll, welcome to local radio. I'm going to buy myself uh, some socks and slippers. That's the kind of guy I am. I'm living life on the edge. I don't care. Plenty coming up on the show this morning. And as always, it'll be good to get your opinions on things. I'll give out the contact details in a few minutes. First of all... 350 million people have got mental health problems. We'll be looking into why. Pet lovers, you are killing your animals with kindness. Do you love your pets as much as you love people? And no one holidays in the UK anymore. It's a slight exaggeration, but you get the idea. But why should we holiday in the UK? It's a rubbish holiday destination, isn't it? Abroad is much better. Just think about America. How cool is that? If you want to get in touch, very easy. You can email 3cr at bbc.co.uk. You can text 81333, starting your text 3CR, or you can give me a phone call 08459 455 555. BBC Three Counties Radio. Now, you or someone close to you may have suffered depression at some point in your lives. Well, today is World Mental Health Day. The theme this year is Depression, a Global Crisis. Across the world, it's estimated that more than 350 million people are affected of all ages and all backgrounds. Among the organisations offering support is a charity called Renaissance, based in Aylesbury. It provides therapeutic group sessions five days a week for people with mental health problems. One of the sessions is their own in-house rock band, and our reporter, Tony Fisher, went along. So, Neil, you're sort of instrumental in getting everything together here, are you? Yeah, yeah, we just, you know, teach them and make it fun for them, which is what it's it's all about. It's all about them enjoying themselves. And And it does sound like they really enjoy themselves as well. I love it. Well, they're all so nice, and the thing is, I think once they get that, that feeling that they can do, actually play music... It totally changes them. You see the smile, like the bow on the piano is phenomenal. It took us a year and a half, two years to get her to play, and now you see her, she's giving it all this on the key, she's brilliant. So, Phil, um, yes. what well, a basic question. What's it like being in the band here, coming to Renaissance? Well, I used to play in bands way back in the day, about 20 years ago. Um, when all that finished, I never thought... You look, you look a bit like a rock star. <laughs> Really, <laughs> grey and balding. Um, yeah, and I, I really never thought I'd play in a band again. Um, but I mentioned to a couple of the people here that I was interested in music. It turned out that Zoe sang a bit, so we started off with just the two of us. Um, it's gradually built up. Tiff came along and played bass first, then she went to the drums. People have just joined, and yeah, I'm playing rock and roll again. It's brilliant. It's what, what is your illness, Phil? I've got epilepsy and uh, depression, anxiety, panic attacks, all that kind of fun stuff. Um, <laughs> so, Tiff, what what is it about coming here to Renaissance and the rock band that really you enjoy most? Um, well, I enjoy it most because it means I can be part of a group because of a disorder I have, being partly being anxious all the time, anxiety. I find it difficult to be in groups. But because music's familiar to me, I feel a bit more safe and secure, so that's what I get out of it. Plus, you know, music's a big part of my life and always has been. Um, but I had a big gap from music when I left school um, to now. Um, I, didn't really, I wasn't really involved in any groups or anything, partly because, again, because of anxiety, I was afraid to join sort of any groups. But um, here, you know, I can come and, you know, take part and, you know, I feel much more sort of safe and secure here than I would anywhere else. So, Andy, what, what are you in the band? I'm the singer. You're the singer? Yeah. Another singer? Well, we have a session on Monday. We're just like a little, little group. And yeah, I'm the only one at the moment, the singer. What, what's your, what are your favourite songs? My favourite song at the moment's got to be Subway's uh, Rock and Roll Queen. And how long have you been coming here to Renaissance? Since December last year. I love it here. What, what, what do you love about it? People, the girls, they, no, not just the girls, but everyone here. Yeah, I love you it. You are rock and roll, aren't you? Wow, well, you know. <laughs> Do 
Tony Fisher there reporting. Joining me in the studio now is the manager of Renaissance, which provides the sessions, Celia Chambers. Good morning, Celia. Good morning. How are you uh, d- uh, coping with mornings? Because this is early, isn't it? <laughs> um, I haven't been up at this uh, in such darkness for a long time. <laughs> there were two sixes in the day. No one, no one told me that when I took this gig. How important do you think this sort of care is for people with mental health issues? Well, I think it's really fundamental because ultimately we're kind of that stepping stone from maybe a long period of, in ho- of being in hospital and supporting that trans- transition from a hospital setting back into the community. Yeah. Um, so we support that side of it. But equally, from the other end, like if someone was starting to become unwell, we can pre- almost prevent maybe a possible relapse from happening. The theme uh, this year of World Mental Health Day is depression. And a lot of people will go, not me, but a lot of people say, oh, for goodness sakes, mm. come on, pull, pull yourself together. Come on, what, what have you got to be depressed about? Mm. How do you cope with that kind of attitude? Because a lot of people listen to this or go, oh, depression's not mental illness, for goodness sakes. Mm. How do you cope with that? How do you, how, what's your kind of argument against that? Well, I guess if you try and relate to the days that um, you've had moments where we've all experienced it, experienced like, you know, finding it hard to wake up, feeling there's like no, pur- like no reason to get up, no purpose, feeling like a failure, um... And then, like, prolonged periods of that make it difficult to, like, socialise. Mm. And it's just kind of making it real to people. Mm. And I think you can make elements of the symptoms of most mental health conditions real to people. Um, and we do that by going and educating sort of mental health nurses. We kind of give them the non-tech side book of things. We give this, you know, the real-life lived experience to sort mm. of say... It, you know, it starts off with a small thing, like, you know, thinking there might have been a time where you've heard footsteps behind you and you've looked around and there's been, like, no one there. And then, you know, they picked up the phone, there's no one on the under, other end of the phone. And we've all kind of had those moments, mm. but these moments build up for that person and get to a point where they might develop into something like paranoia. But all these symptoms we can relate to in some way. How do you get people to come along? Because with things like depression, mm-hmm. it's a very isolating disease. I've had moments of depression and yeah. uh, all I've wanted to do is... Uh, just just to hide in my bedroom, and I've done it for weeks on, uh, at times. How do you get people to get out of their bedrooms or out of that chair in the the, the living room and come and hang out well, with serv- other people? Well, I guess our service is so client centred, and the reason why it's meaningful activity is that the sessions we offer are informed by the people we support. Mm. So we have discussions with them, and we're kind of quite flexible in our approach. So even though they choose sessions to attend we kind of say well if you come if you come in and you're not feeling up to participate in the activity that's okay we'd rather you were there in person there you know even if you're just sitting there in a room full of people not talking that's okay so it's permission to sort of come in and be quiet Mm. and they that's the ethos of yeah, our service. Not quite with that rock band. Well, yeah. In the background. That's, that's <laughs> yeah. Some of them crave to make noise, and that, we give the space to do so. <laughs> your funding is quite complex, isn't it? How does it work, and where, where do you get your money from? Okay, so... And your face dropped when I asked that question. Is it that complicated? It is very complicated. It's <laughs> hard <your> to... <laughs> um, well, we can... People can self-fund now. Um, there's now a movement towards direct payment, so they're previously... Um, Community services and um, Bucks County Council would just fund a service that they saw that was a need for that individual. Mm. And now what's happening is that an individual is given sort of a personal health budget and given the choice of how they would like to spend their money to attend the services they would like to. Oh, so instead of groups getting money... The, the the client gets a fund that they then choose where they want to go and spend it. Yeah. Wow. So that's what makes services like us, we have to be more competitive and more marketable because we're competing, you know, at the end of the day, it's that person's choice. Yeah. Um, and then our still, our main source of funding is Bucks County Council and they're primarily for people who've been referred to us by community mental health teams. How do you think, World Mental Health Day today, mm-hmm. what does that mean exactly? Is that, it's not going to achieve anything, is it? Well, I think it it's helpful. A, I think, well, I, I, not in itself. I think it's something that needs to be tackled from like school age, going, you know, awareness generally, employment. You know, there's still such a stigma, and everyone, you know, getting people back to work, which is what the government's really trying to do. But mm. with the economic climate as it is, and awareness of mental health in general. But at the end of the day, one in four people have a mental health problem, um, and it's just. Just tackling that stigma and discrimination. Is there still a stigma around it? Yeah, definitely. How, uh, how does that manifest itself? What, what have you seen? Well, for example, I mean, it was quite accepting now, but we try and do a lot of groups that are in the community. So I started to do a gym group and, you you know, I went into preliminary discussions about, you know, we're, we're a group, we, you know, this is our client group, this is what we're trying to do. And it's kind of, 
that sort of oh it's like okay well we'll try you know and it's like well what do you think is gonna yeah a little bit i mean it's fine you know it's like well we'll see how it goes but yeah yeah, initially sometimes what what, what, what were they worried about the people gonna start stabbing each other and well i mean the media well unfortunately the media and everything does sort of hone in on you know what a person you know the condition but but you know it was a moment in their time, in their life. It's a bit like someone with diabetes having to take insulin every day. Someone with schizophrenia has to take medication every day not to hear the voices. It's, mm. But it's, you know, portrayed in very, very different ways. I suppose there is a fear, isn't it? Because uh, if you've got a broken leg, mm. I can see that. Yeah. Uh, if, if you're having chemo, I can see, I can probably see that more times than not. If you've got a mental illness, I, I don't know what it is. I can't see it. Yeah. I don't know how it's affecting you. And I guess that's probably part of the fear, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, definitely. And I think... As I say, again, like films and stuff, when someone's having a psychotic episode, yeah, it's not a, it's not a nice thing to witness. But mm. that was one moment in their life. The likelihood is that person may never experience that again. But, you know... It's Very quickly, because we're running out of time. Okay. I, told, I told you I'll go quickly. <laughs> when you came in, you said, you've got to let me plug my Christmas oh, bowl. What, yes. So what's happening? Go on. Well, we've got a Christmas craft fair happening on the Saturday the 17th of November at our service um, in Aylesbury. Um, part of our craft fairs we rely quite a lot on charity raffles so quite often we're always on the lookout for local organizations like restaurants hairdressers or people like that if they're able to support our cause by donating something for a raffle is there a website that we should go to unfortunately we're not we don't have our you own website, website. I, you know, know. I, it is, I know i know it's we're on facebook we are on facebook <laughs> my, my mum's on facebook that doesn't mean anything what's the facebook page um it's renaissance day center listen best of luck thank you very much thank you very are you much. going on the march later on today there's a little march isn't there somewhere through town are you having any of that? I've got to go back to work. <sighs> I know. You're part-timer, <laughs> Celia Chambers. Celia, lovely to meet you. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Celia Chambers there um, from uh, Renaissance, which provides uh, lots of help people with mental illness. 08459 four double five five double five. Good morning. It's 6.15. It's Wednesday, the 10th of October. These are your headlines this morning on BBC Three Counties Radio. Counter-terrorism police have arrested a man and a woman at Heathrow Airport. As you've just heard, it's World Mental Health Day, an awareness initiative set up by the World Health Organisation. This year, the focus is on depression. And in sport, England players have been told they face suspension from the national side without appeal if they break a new code of contact, conduct, uh, which the FHM and David Bernstein hopes to have in place by next month. Coming up, two little ducks, 22, but there could soon be none. More bingo halls are closing in the three counties. Hear more after the weather in a few minutes with Chris. BBC Three Counties Radio. Simply Red, of course. This is Ian Lee, BBC Three Counties Radio, 08459 four double five five double five. Later on, we'll be talking about why less people are holidaying in Britain. Be honest, it's not. It's a great place to live. I love living here. It's fantastic. But you wouldn't want to go on a holiday in Britain, would you? I mean, a weekend away, yeah, of course, you, you might find somewhere decent to go. But really, abroad is so much better, isn't it? 08459 four double five five double five. Now, are you a fan of the bingo? I must admit, I've played it in my time. I like it. I used to go with my nan. Uh, I've not been for a long time. I did, I used to go with my nan. We used to love it. Um, it's kind of an old person's game, though, isn't it, really? And that's possibly why a lot of uh, the bingo halls are closing down. More than 100 bingo halls have shut down in the last five years. This morning, on the show, can we try and find the youngest bingo player listening to this show? Are we going to find anybody under the age of 65 who plays bingo? I hope we do. 08459 four double five five double five. Bingo clubs say they're closing because they face heavy taxes on their profits and can't compete with online bingo, which doesn't pay as much. Well, our reporter, Sophie Solaria, uh, has paid a visit to one bingo hall in the three counties to hear from the punters themselves. I, th- I think it's good fun. It's good fun to play. It's, it can be a laugh. You can win money for free as well on free sessions. And have you ever played online? No, I haven't played online. Because it defeats the point of playing bingo. Um, the whole point of playing is to get involved instead of just sitting at home in front of a computer. But then are you finding that there's a decrease in people coming to play or have you noticed it becoming more popular? I think it's becoming popular, especially with the younger people. How many people have you seen playing bingo in a bingo hall? Um, at this club, a few, couple of hundred, but at other clubs there's a plenty more. This is one of the smallest clubs. so It's a lot of people. Yeah, definitely. And it's only getting bigger as well. Including younger people, not just old biddies. It it, it used to be older people, but now it's appealing to the younger people a lot more. Why do you think that is? Um, It's a chance to win money for nothing, really, and it's fun. Hi, madam. So, why do you come to bingo? Well, I don't like it standing doors, and I I enjoy it. I enjoy playing bingo. It's exciting when you you think you're going to win, and you don't, but you don't expect to win all the time. Have you ever won? Oh, yeah. 
many times. About a thousand pounds. I haven't gone back years ago on the tables. A thousand pounds. Wow. Years and years ago. Do you ever play online? No. Are you finding less and less people are coming to bingo? Yeah. Really? Yeah, re- recently, yeah. Have you noticed many young people, though? Quite a lot, yeah. More so. You get crowds and crowds and coming in sometimes, like hen nights and all that. Every, every old lady has got a story about winning £1,000 a few years ago. My nan used to say, I won £1,000 once. It was a few years ago. Um, Alison Carr is from Watford and she's worked in the bingo hall all her life. Good morning, Alison. Good morning. Why do you love bingo so much? Um... I don't know, I really, I think it's a nice place, the atmosphere is really nice, um, to, to, to go into the bingo hall and play, you've got more, it's, I think it's just nice, it's relaxing, and, and at the end very of the, relaxed. and at the end of the day, when you go out, the best place to go, I tell a lot of people, is bingo, because at least you know when you've gone out and had a good night, at least you've got a chance of coming home with some money in your pocket. Alison, what's the most you've ever won? A thousand pounds. A few years ago? Actually, um, <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, thank I you do, very but much. I play online, so <laughs> yeah, I won online as well. Alison, stay there. We've also got Val, who, uh, Val Stevens, who runs the bingo at Tring Community Centre. Now, you don't uh, run a bingo hall, Val, but you've noticed more people coming to play bingo with you, haven't you? Yes, I have. What, why do you think that is? Oh, hang on, <laughs> hang on a minute, Val. Alison, do you need some milk? Oh, sorry. I just heard you go, milk. <laughs> are, are you all right? I'm fine. Oh, okay, you, you, you stay there. I'll, I'll turn your microphone down a little bit so you can get your milk. Sorry, Val, I do apologise. Alison needed some milk there. Okay. Uh, what, what, what's the attraction of bingo? Uh, uh, well, for us, um, a social evening. Yeah. Um, just, just a night out. What's, so, the, you know, what's the age range of the people who come and play with you? Between 22 and 84. Are you sure about the 22-year-old? Yes, I am. Really? Yeah, because she had her 21st birthday last year. Did she really? Yes, she did. Because it, it is perceived... And listen, I've played bingo a long time ago, and it's a lot of fun. It is perceived as an old biddies game, though, isn't it? Yes. How do we... We need to make it sexy, Val. How do we sex up bingo? <laughs> you can't sex oh. up... Well, we can't sex up bin, bingo anyway, because we're... Um, we have it in Tring Community Hall. Yeah. Um, it's a social evening more than, all right, it's nice to win a bit of money and you're not paying out a terrific amount like you do, or you used to do, in the big halls. Yeah. The, the big halls used to have those link-ups, didn't they? Nationwide link-ups. Yeah. Where you could win, like, quarter of a million pounds or something. Yeah, but who... I, I never knew anybody that did. <laughs> you're not <laughs> suggesting that that was in any way some sort of scam, are you, Valerie? No, no, no. <laughs> no, but, um, you know, people... You could go there. I have been to the big ones. Yeah. And it's, it is tempting to sort of play the scatterboards, play this, play that. Yeah. And before you know where you are, there's 50 quid gone. You, you I, can I, spend I, quite a bit of money, can't you? I know, you know, I do know people that have gone there and spent £50 pound in a night. Wow. Wow, that's incredible. Yeah, it is. Ever played online bingo, Val? Nope. No, good for you. I don't know. Like, it, it, it defeats the object. It's the, the, you lose the social you lose, event. Of course you do. You lose the social... And you could, I would imagine, you could get addicted to it. I would imagine you could. Alison? Yes? Did you get your milk sorted, love? Uh, yes, I'm sorry. No, don't apologise. <laughs> no. Alison, very quickly, before we let you go, and mm-hmm. uh, we let Val go, a lot of people think that when you win a line or you get a, a full house on bingo, you shout house. You don't shout that, do you? No. What, what, do, you, what do you shout? Me? Yes. <laughs> go on, give us, give us your yes in your best voice. Yes. There we go. Let's chat the ladies' card and we shall see. Thank you, Alison Carr. Uh, worked in the bingo hall all her life. And Val Stevens runs the bingo at Trink. I was always told, you go, ee That's that's That was the call my nan had. ee You've got to be loud, a little bit common, then you shout it out. That was my nan through and through. 08459 four double five five double five. Can we find the youngest bingo player listening to this show? And we need your suggestions on how to make bingo sexy. While we're pondering on that, let's listen to Sophie Tyler, who I think will make an excellent bingo caller. Sophie Tyler, BBC Three Counties Radio. Big up yourself, Sophie. Let's get the latest news and sport now with Catherine Boyle. The BBC in beds, hearts and bugs. This is BBC Three Counties Radio. Morning. 
We're trying to find the youngest bingo player listening to this show. 08459 four double five five double five. I don't want to accuse our reporter, Sophie Solaria, of faking reports. I don't believe that young gentleman. I think that was her boyfriend or something that she dragged along. Is there really anybody under the age of 65 who plays bingos in beds, uh, bingo in Beds, Hearts and Bucks? Coming up in the next half an hour, your pet could be getting a little bit chubby, and it's probably your fault. My cat got a bit overweight, and I got told off by the vet and had to put her on a strict diet. We'll find out a bit more later on, not about my cat, but about your pets, perhaps. And TV presenter Justin Lee Collins has been found guilty of harassing his former partner. BBC Three Counties reporter Victoria Cook was at the court. All of that and more after the Supremes. The Supremes, baby love. Ian Lee, BBC Three Counties Radio. It's the 10th of October, kids. Who'd have thunk it? Now, have you got a pet? I'm a big fan of pets. I've got a cat, my little cat, Velvet, uh, who, uh, until my children was, uh, were born, was the most important. I l- oh, I love that cat. And she got a bit neglected when the kids came along, but now she's kind of back in the family fold and she's fantastic. She got a little bit chubby. Not like a huge fat cat. She had a bit of a tummy, and uh, the vet told me off, and um, I had to put her on a diet and take her for a little little monthly weigh-in. And I think she, she lost a lot of weight. She may have put a little bit back on, but she's, you know, she's an old lady. So, um, how long do cats live for? She's 13. How, how many more years have I got? Anyway, you probably feed your pet the occasional treat. You could be harming your animals. More than a third of UK dog owners have fed their dogs toxic or harmful food, including milk grapes, raisins and chocolate, not knowing that by treating their beloved pets to these types of food, they're putting their health at risk. Well, Jan Green uh, has got a Labrador dog, a Deco, who was diagnosed as morbidly obese after he weighed in at more than eight stone, Jan. Yes, definitely. Eight stone? Yes. <laughs> what on earth? How did he get so big? Um, well, basically, because, like you just said, all the treats on top of his normal daily food. What kind of treats? Were you one of these people that would give him the, the Sunday roast leftovers? Yes. Oh, so he'd have, he'd have, like, sprouts and potatoes and a bit of beef? Yeah, and the Yorkshire pudding. Oh, Jan, <laughs> what were you thinking? Well, it's a case of education. Right. <laughs> um, but, but... Which I, I finally got that from the PDSA um, when I took him with an ear infection. Yeah. And um, they said, you know, all these treats are no good for him. Give him heart condition or diabetes or arthritis in his older age. <laughs> so everything had to stop. And uh, how did Deco react to when being put on a strict diet, Jan? Uh, he didn't like it whatsoever. No, I bet he didn't um, like it. What did he do? Um, he used to follow everybody round and we were up after them if, if the children dropped anything. He'd be there to move it up. People used to chuck food over the fence at him? They did, yeah. Um, ham bones, etc. <laughs> so, so people knew. You, your, your fat dog was famous for being fat. So famous well, that people would chuck ham bones at him over the well, fence. Well, this is it. All right, if he had space, he would just throw it over. Yeah. <laughs> and one particular day, we'd made some buns with the um, grandchildren. Yeah. Put them on the side to cool, and Deco ate... All 36. Sweet home Alabama! <laughs> you, all, you just scoffed them all down? He scoffed oh, them all down and left the Jan. papers on the kitchen floor. Naughty, naughty deco. You uh, put him t- into a pet fit club, is that right? I did, yes. How does that work? Of things. That was marvellous. I mean, the advice and the encouragement and support from the staff at PDSA was absolutely fantastic. What did you have to do in the pet fit club? Um, well, basically, we had to weigh his food to start with. Yeah. And then he got, as he got, um, as he started to reduce his weight, he got l- more active. Yeah. So he got longer walks, which also helped me, because I also lost these stones. Well, I was going to ask, Jan, because it, it is often said that um, owners look like their pets. And I was going to ask, uh, politely, as politely as I could, <laughs> did you get fat as well? Yes, I was nearly 17 stone. <laughs> Jan! You and Deco, what are you two like? Are you sure he ate all of those buns and it wasn't you? <laughs> no, it weren't me. <laughs> okay, so you, you but, but in, in helping Deco lose a bit of weight and going on longer walks, you lost some weight as well, did you? Yes, I lost it. It's him as him, three stone. Fantastic. Well, well Janice, yeah. can, I, can I, one, one final question. Why did you choose a dog when cats are obviously much, much better? We have a cat as well. And do they get on? 
Um, my, uh, well, we've just got a new kitten class. I had to have my other one put to sleep. Oh, I'm sorry to 17. hear that. Seventeen. Oh, that's well, that's a, that's a crack your And ca- yeah. cats are better than dogs, though. Aren't they better company than dogs? Oh no, I love my dog. Okay. Well, Jan, <laughs> listen. Lots of love to you and Deco. Okay, it's his birthday today. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm not. I'm not doing a birthday shout out to a dog. I'm not doing that. But Jan, thank you very much indeed, Jan Green. Uh, and later, Justin's going to be going to a vet in Bedfordshire mm-hmm. to get some useful pet advice. I, it does amaze me. I've had a dog and I've had a cat. Cats are much better company, aren't they? They're, they're more independent. You don't have to take them out for walks. And people who say that cats don't love you, of course they do. Cats are much friendlier, much nicer than dogs. Try and defend yourself, dog owners, you can't. 08459 455 555, Randy Crawford. Randy Crawford, one day I'll fly away. Good morning, this is Ian Lee, BBC Three Counties Radio. Cats is better than dogs. And bingo's for old biddies. 08459 455 555. Wednesday the 10th of October, 6.45. These are your headlines this morning on BBC Three Counties Radio. Two people have been arrested at Heathrow Airport on suspicion of committing terrorism offences. The Prime Minister will tell the Conservative Party conference this morning that the UK is in a global race which, uh, in which it's sink or swim. In sport, Saracens are due to hold a fans forum at Old Albanian's RFC tonight from half past seven. And your weather across beds, hearts and bucks. A chilly, misty start, then fine and dry with sunny spells. Top temperature is 40 degrees. Coming up, hear more on the television presenter and comedian Justin Lee Collins, who's been found guilty of harassing his former partner. BBC Three Counties Radio. Now, the television presenter Justin Lee Collins has been found guilty of harassing his former partner, Anna Lark. I need to, uh, say, I know, I know both of these people here, so I need to take a slight step back from this story. A jury at St Albans Crown Court agreed he'd subjected her to sustained emotional and domestic abuse during their seven month relationship. He's been given 140 hours of community service. Our reporter, Victoria Cook, was in court. Good morning, Victoria. Good morning. Remind us what the, the, this case was about. Well, Justin Lee Collins' former partner, Anna Lark, told the jury that she was subjected to sustained emotional and domestic abuse during the seven-month relationship she had with him. She said he made her write down all her previous sexual encounters regardless of how graphic and went on to tell the court that he even made her sleep facing him. She said he made her throw away DVDs because they featured actors she found attractive and she said he made death threats against her. Now, one of the key parts of this case was a, a secret recording she'd made of him and it was of, her, of him verbally abusing her during a row. It's quite graphic, uh, but during the recording we hear him call her a number of offensive names. Uh, He said the recording showed him at his worst, but he denied all her other claims. He told the court He'd never attacked her in any way and had never hit anyone in his life. Collins said he'd only ever slapped Miss Lark once to calm her down when she was self-harming. What did the judge say? Well, after he delivered the guilty verdict, the judge was asked by the defence to consider a financial penalty, but the judge told the court he didn't really think that was sufficient, so he sentenced Collins to, Collins to these 140 hours of unpaid community work instead, and he said he's got a year to do that. The judge told him it's humbling work for somebody who lives a prominent public life, but he said it should make him pause and think about what he'd done. He also said Collins had had a successful career up to now, and he had led a decent life. He really acknowledged that in court yesterday. He did say it would be would have been to Justin Lee Collins' credit, though, if he had had the courage at the beginning to admit his violence against Miss Lark. He said that's why this punishment was so substantial. Well, yesterday afternoon, Miss Lark's family released a statement describing their relief at the verdict. It said, We're absolutely ecstatic with the verdict and are relieved the jury were able to see through the lies of an abuser. We will not rest on our laurels in the wake of this good news and intend to go out into the world and use this experience to empower women to stand up to domestic abuse. Justin Lee Collins' lawyers also released a statement saying Justin's extremely disappointed by the verdict. He will consider his position with his lawyers. Mm. What's been the response from the police? Well, after the case finished yesterday, Detective Inspector Justine Jenkins read a statement to journalists waiting outside the court. No one should endure this sort of violent behaviour from anyone, least of all from someone with whom they have an intimate relationship. Together with the Crown Prosecution Service and the Watford Local Crime Unit... My team has worked really hard to bring this case before a jury and I hope the outcome serves as a warning to anyone who thinks it's okay to treat another person in this manner. The victim was extremely brave in coming forward to report the offences inflicted upon her 
I would urge anyone who is or has been in a similar situation to get in contact with police as soon as possible. I can reassure you that you will be taken seriously and treated with sensitivity. Well, there we go. That's the police statement on the uh, Justin Lee uh, Collins case, who's been found guilty of harassing his former partner, Anna Lark. Thank you very much to our reporter, Victoria Cook. Now, let's have one of the best pop songs in the world, shall we? It's the best song ever. And one day, I will bring in the recording of my two-and-a-half-year-old boy singing it. He knows all of the words. He knows all of the words. the Thatcher's uh, texted in. Can you tell me who Justin Lee Collins is? Other than hearing his name on the news, I've never heard of him. You pro- Well, you, you may not have done. He's a comedian and a presenter and you've, you, you'll recognise him when you see him. He looks like a lion. Is the simple description. He's got long flowing hair and a big beard. I'm, I'm, I'm tempted to grow a beard. I've mentioned this last week. I really am tempted to grow a beard. And I, I, but I, I'm not going to grow a moustache for November. I, I, moustaches are ridiculous. Even if they are raising money for charity, well done you. I'm not going to grow a moustache. I'm tempted to go with a beard. But I do worry that if you have a beard, you look a little bit... You look like a pervert, basically. You look like a deviant. You do a little bit. There's something odd about, about gentlemen with beards. And I, I, I think I could carry it off. If you've got a beard, could you give me a call and give me the pros and cons? And if you're a lady, beard, if your fella's grown a beard, does it work? Do you like beards? Because some women are into them. Some women like beard, have a beard fetish going. They'll only go out with men who've got beards. And some men, they look really weird without a beard. Have you ever seen Noel Edmonds without a beard? Honestly, I, there, is a, I, there is a picture of him on the internet. Find it. Him without a beard. He looks weird. It's like he's always had a beard. He must have been born with a beard, that man. Like a little baby beard on a baby Edmunds. I, I, I'm tempted to grow a beard. There's, a, there's that weird stage, though, isn't there, where you look stubbly, then you've got a month of looking like you're homeless. You, you've just got that kind of the scruffy look, and then it becomes a beard. Look, they found the picture of Edmunds without a beard and they're loving it. <laughs> Go on, is it? Go and Google it. It's a strange thing. Edmunds without a beard. 08459 oh, 455 555. The beard phone in is happening. Now, we were talking about bad driving habits on the show recently, and Bill Brady got in touch. He's an independent road safety consultant from Bedfordshire. And no one could quite remember how it's these kind of boy challenges where, you know, it's boys, it's bravado, it's showing off a little bit. But Justin Dealey, uh, the reporter here, you may have heard him, well, muttering on air, uh, and I, someone challenged the other one to a driving test to see who'd get on the best, and Bill kind of stepped in and said, OK, I will marshal this conversation competition. Basically, we wanted to find out, would we still pass if we took the test? You can hear us both in action, driving after seven. We did it on Monday. But before we went out to see who's got the best driving skills, we discussed the importance of road safety. OK, I'm in the uh, BBC Three Counties luxury car park. I'm joined by Bill. Bill, just very briefly, what's your job title? What do you do? Uh, I'm an independent road safety advisor. I, um, I can tell people whether the driving's any good or not. Don't do it for a living because they, we leave that a driver standards agency. But what I can tell you as an advanced driving uh, in, uh, person uh, running a local group is that we're trying to make people safer. We can tell you today whether you'd pass the driving standard uh, that you'd be expecting a test and then afterwards we can advise you how you can actually improve that. Now, I've been having a bit of a joke about this on air, but there is actually a serious element to this, isn't it? it, it it's to make the road safer. It's certainly to make the road safer, yeah. Uh, if, a lo- if everybody took up advanced driving after they took their test, and, or at least down the road decided to improve it, we would be a lot safer. It's proven by insurance companies that anyone who takes an advanced driving test is usually 50% less likely to crash than ordinary drivers. I'm going to go out, and Justin's going to go out as well. What kind of things are you going to be looking for in our driving? Well, in the driving test, we'll be looking that you do it properly. You might not even be able to remember when you started doing it properly. You've got a very stern look in your eyes. I'm getting a little bit nervous all of a sudden. No, no, I'm not stern at all. I might be out on the road, but I'm not here. Okay. Um, all, you're, all you're asked to do is what, you, what a learner driver would do if you went out today to get that little certificate that lasts virtually all their life unless they're silly and throw it away. What, kind of, what are the most obvious and basic mistakes that people make when they've been driving for a while? Well, I don't know if I should tell you that when you're just going out, because then you'll try and correct them, won't you? You saw through that. Okay, can I just verify, there is no chance of me losing my driving licence today, is there? Not unless you throw it out the window. 
OK, well, Justin Daly is here, the BBC Three Counties reporter. Justin, we've been bigging this up as a competition. Mm. There's a serious element to it, though, but I am going to beat you. <laughs> <laughs> What's your driving like? My driving has improved, I think, the, the older I've got, but certainly when I was younger it wasn't particularly great. Um, it took me five attempts to pass my driving test, which is not something to be proud of. Um, but, yeah, I think the older I've got, the more I've taken things seriously on the roads, let's say. OK, I'm, I'm certainly older. My, my bad boy days are, are far behind me, but I am going to beat you. Let's go steady. Let's go driving. After seven, you'll get to hear both Justin uh, Dealey and myself on the roads of Luton. And I have to say, and, and then we're going to find out who is the best driver. We don't know the results yet. I have to say, if I lose to Dealey, I will be furious and I will demand a recount because I have, n- without giving too much away, I have never seen such shoddy driving. Now, the interesting thing is, uh, when I was driving, Justin was kind of interviewing me and Bill and recorded it. And when Justin was driving, I recorded it but justin has edited what you're going to hear now i know what happened in that car it'll be interesting to it'll be, yeah we'll be interesting to hear which bits justin has kept in and which bits justin has decided weren't appropriate for you to hear because I, I will not be silenced on this the truth will be heard Oh eight four five nine four double five five double five is the telephone number a little bit later on in the show we'll be asking do you holiday in britain be honest okay if you've got the choice of going on a holiday. And when I say holiday, I don't mean a, week, a weekend. I mean, you know, like a week, two weeks. Holiday away or holiday in Britain, what would you rather go for? It's got to be abroad every time. I love living in Britain. It's fantastic. I wouldn't want... Well, I, I, I did nearly live in Japan, but the, the, I, I wouldn't want to live many other places. But holidaying in Britain, it's got nothing to offer. Apart from, of course, Sophie Tyler. Have a think about it. What is there in Britain that's worth staying here on holiday for? The weather's awful. There's not a lot to see or do. Abroad is so much better. Spain is better than Britain, isn't it? We'll find out after the news and sport with Catherine Boyle. Dear listeners, sorry for that little pause. There, I was discussing guitars with our next guest. I can only apologise for that. This is Ian Lee on BBC Three Counties Radio. Plenty coming up in the next hour, including World Mental Health Day comes to the Three Counties. Find out more in a few, more in a few minutes. Bingo halls continue to close. Can we really find anyone under the age of 65 who plays? I, I, listen, I love a bit of bingo, but it, let's be honest, it's an old biddies game, isn't it? And Visit Britain wants to overhaul the tourism industry. No one enjoys holidays at home in Britain. Europe and America and, and Japan, they're, they're much better places. If you disagree, 08459 455 555. You can email, of course... 3cr at bbc.co.uk or you can send me a text 81333 starting your text 3cr BBC Three Counties Radio Now you or someone close to you may have suffered depression at some point in your lives well today is World Mental Health Day and the theme this year is depression a global crisis across the world it's estimated that more than 350 million people are affected of all ages and all backgrounds among the organisations offering support is a charity called Renaissance based in Aylesbury it provides therapeutic group sessions five days a week for people with mental health problems Celia Chambers the manager came in and told me earlier on that everyone can relate to the symptoms of mental health I think you can make elements of the symptoms of most mental health conditions real to people um, and we do that by going and educating sort of mental health nurses. We kind of give them the non-tech side book of things. We give this, you know, the real life lived experience to sort mm. of say, it, you know, it starts off with a small thing like, you know, thinking there might have been a time where you've heard footsteps behind you and you've looked around and there's been like no one there. And then, you know, they picked up the phone. There's no one on the under, other end of the phone. And we've all kind of had those moments, mm. but these moments build up for that person and get to a point where they might develop into something like paranoia. But all these symptoms we can relate to in some way. Okay, joined by a couple of guests now. We've got Gail Deering from NHS Bedford. Good morning, Gail. Good morning. Uh, and we've got Phil Graham, uh, who uses the support group. Good morning, Phil. Good morning. And we were just discussing guitars a little bit geekily. We were, we were indeed. Because yes. if anyone heard the report earlier on, at, at Renaissance, there is, uh, there's a rock group. Well, two rock two groups, rock, you were saying. Yeah, yeah uh, kind of a metal group called Insanity. <laughs> Very and, nice. And uh, a uh, more eclectic group called the Cellar Rats, because uh, we used to rehearse in the cellar. Which, are you in both of those yes. bands? Yes, Fantastic. I have that privilege. <laughs> <laughs> now, can I, I'm going to ask you a direct question. If I ask you anything you don't want to answer, just tell me to get knotted. Get knotted. Uh, OK, <laughs> thanks very much for coming in. Feel great, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> how, how, what, are, what are your issues with mental health? How are you affected? Um, I suffer from depression yep. um, 
but but when you say depression, it's not just depression. Mm. Um, anybody that's diagnosed with a particular mental health issue is bound to have side effects mm. of, of, of other um, issues like paranoia, um, anxiety, um, and I also suffer from epilepsy, mm. which doesn't help matters. But yeah, it, it wouldn't help matters. I'd imagine. Um, no, I'd imagine that's not. Yeah, good. yeah. I mean, th- that added to the to the depression, and yeah. at the time I got laid off from a job, my mother had a stroke and died, so that kind of started the whole thing off. Um, and initially, I just didn't didn't want to leave the house. Yeah. Um, but you can't live like that. And I was put in touch with Renaissance by my GP. Yeah. Um, I went for an initial interview there, and I didn't start for about six weeks after that initial interview, but then mm. I plucked up courage. And that was 13 years ago, and I've not looked and now they can't since. get rid of you. They can't get rid of me. They've I'm, tried, I'm, and they can't I'm, kick I you out. i chained myself to the building. Now, a lot of people listening will, when they hear the word depression, they're like, oh, for goodness sakes, just pull yourself together, man. Come on, we all get a little bit down. Sort yourself out. But, but having suffered depression myself... I know it's a lot more serious than that. Oh, absolutely. How did it affect you? How did, uh, I'm going to ask the impossible question, but how did it make you feel when you were at the depths of your depression? <laughs> I, I just couldn't face going out. Mm. I just couldn't face leaving the flat. I, I wouldn't answer the phone. Um, but I eventually learned that after a couple of days, it gradually starts to get better. So basically, I've just got to wait it out, and then I can perhaps start going to the shop... Um, and, and start mixing with people but mm. renaissance has done so much for me um give me the confidence because i used to play guitar way back in the when uh, about 20 years ago um that all finished and i never thought i'd play music again but here i am playing was there again. a turning point because you were in inverted commas normal you know you're a normal civilian you play guitar you obviously interactive you could perform in public was there a point when it changed, and you did kind of lose self-confidence and become depressed. Yeah. Um, as I said, it was the time when uh, I got made redundant mm. from a job I'd had for 15 years. Um, because of the epilepsy, I was advised to give up my driving licence, which I love driving. And then, like I said, my mother died of a stroke very suddenly in 94. All those things combined just mm. knocked me for six. Good for your doctor to recommending you, because some doctors, even now, can still be a bit old. You go and do some exercise. Yeah, Keep a diary, yeah. go and do some exercise. Well, I've, I've got very good support from a GP. That's um, great. For the, uh, uh, I think it's the North East Mental Health Team. Um, they, they, they've all been very supportive. And, yeah, I've, I've not looked back. I mean, How does the funding work for you in Renaissance? Well, I'm lucky because I'm poor. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Um, yeah, because they, you, you're financially assessed. Right. Um, and below a certain level, I guess. Do they know about your five guitars, Phil? Oh, dear. <laughs> they, they they're prob- all cheap ones. He told me they're all cheap encores. <laughs> they, they don't probably, worry. They probably do now, actually, <laughs> if they listen. So to that you get assessed and you, are, you fall below the certain criteria. Yeah. So yeah. everything's paid for everything's for you? Everything's paid for for me, yeah. Uh, we, we pay 50 pence per session to cover tea and coffee and stuff right. like that. But, but basically the sessions are funded by, I guess, social services. Hmm. Um, so, yeah, I'm... I'm Lucky that I'm poor, I guess. And if you didn't go to Renaissance, if you didn't have that outlet, what would your life be like? It would be... I wouldn't have a life. Right. Um, it would be wander down the Sainsbury's four or five times a day and chat to the girls on the till there, and that would be it. Mm. Um, just, just aimlessly wandering. Um, Renaissance has given me a focus. I've done... Oh, well, there's the music, obviously... Um, I go to the gym, we do arts and crafts, I've done jewellery making, watercolours, poetry, you name it, and they've given me the opportunity to express myself, which I wouldn't have had without them. Fantastic. So it's, it's kind of brought me out of myself, um, and they're all wonderful people there. All of them? All of them. You sure? Without exception. Come on, there's got to be someone you Especially like. Celia, who's probably listening. <laughs> Celia was on earlier on, yeah. Hi, Gail, Celia. Gail, you're from <laughs> NHS Bedford. I'm, I'm from SEPT, which provides mental health services, and from the Make a Difference group, which is what's heading up the events today. Well, there, there are events today. What are you there doing are, for, for Well Mental well, Health Well, what Day? we're doing, it, it relates very much to what you were talking about, actually. What we're focusing on this year is the relationship between mental well-being and the arts, mm. which is about, obviously, things like depression and other types of mental health problems. If you do other things that focus your mind in terms of music or art, or creative arts, 
thoughts that can distract you and actually, as you say, bring something back into your life. So we've got two events in the squares, one in Bedford in Pigeon Square, or mm-hmm. some people know it as Church Square. That's starting at 10 and going through till 2. And we've got a music band called the Bed- Barford Avenue All Stars who are playing there. You really, we've, Phil? We've got no, Lauren. Not that one. Oh, we, that we, one. Okay. we hope to collaborate. We hope to collaborate. We were just talking yes. about that. But we're being opened by a gentleman called Lawrence Robinson, who's a well renowned opera singer locally. He's opening us at 10 o'clock. And then we've got loads of stalls, um, Zumba, we've got DJ, we've got loads of things going on. Then we've got an arts trail, which is going to look at art around the town. Mm. Um, so there's going to be guides for that. And Luton, we've got an event again. We've got arts trail. We've got a mega doodle, which is basically people coming She's to got draw. A, what? a mega doodle. <laughs> oh dear, oh dear. So it's been run by adult learning. Sounds and basically, crazy. you come into, come into a market and you, l- you draw. Anybody can draw. It's that whole thing about connecting and, and talking to each other and interacting. We've got Nyabingi African drummers coming at 12 o'clock. We've got the deputy mayor opening at 10. So we've got a whole load of stuff so it's, going it's on kind of busy day. Day. What are you hoping to achieve from we, all of this? We though? want to get messages across. So basically, for me, World Mental Health Day is an opportunity to say to people, we all have a mental health. Let's look after it. Sometimes we have a problem with it, but we need to challenge stigma and discrimination against people with mental mm. ill health. We need to get people talking about it and promoting mental well-being and, ta- and getting young people involved and, and not being frightened about mental health anymore. There is but a stigma attached to there it. Is, and there will be there people is. listening now going, oh, come on, please, yeah. for goodness sakes. And I suffer from depression. And I'm, uh, I was, was unsure whether I was going to mention it today or yeah. not because... Yeah. And that's exactly the point, isn't it? But why is there a stigma around it? I think people are fearful, and I think it's because it's been such a taboo subject. If you remember, it's not that many years ago we used to shut people away with mental health problems, and Mm. then we sort of talked about people coming out into the community. And people still... I mean, depression is probably the most acceptable, in inverted commas, type of mental health problem. You start mentioning terms like schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, and people back away even more. And I think we just have to develop that understanding because people live lives and they're out there and, and, you know, people can contribute to the community. I guess that quite often when we hear the word schizophrenia, it is in a a news story where someone has uh, had an attack, has has gone bonkers, you know, for one of the best phrases, and stabbed someone. For every one person with a mental health problem that stabbed somebody, how many people without mental health problems have have done that? You know, it's like, what they say, one in four people has experience of uh, mental health problems yeah well look at your three closest friends and if they seem okay <laughs> it's you yeah. Yeah. yeah very very quickly Gail. last question the, the growing concerns about cuts to mental health services yes. such as mine yes. how are they going to continue their work if, if there are cuts to their service I, and I funding? think i think what we need to be doing is we need to make sure we've, we've have, have very close partnerships because yes there are going to be cuts but we have to get smarter and we have to work together and we have to make sure all the organizations are, and this is what these events are like we're mm. we're doing these events very cheaply we work together with partners like mind power all the local organizations and yes we will have to be stronger and, and, and make sure that we offer things and, and get the community involved because actually, you know, lots of people can access lots of different resources locally. It doesn't have to cost a fortune, but also it's like people being accepted into, you know, mainstream activities and people mm. being able to access things just like anybody else. Well, listen, so, thank you very much for coming can in. Can I just do a quick hello no, to Graham Munns, Alison Fuller, Joseph Mandesia, who are, are my organisers for some oh. of the events this morning. Thank no, you. No, absolutely could, I, could I just mention again, we've got this uh, charity event on the 17th of November at Renaissance. Um, donations always welcome. You've mentioned it. Well done. Thank you very okay, much. Thank Phil you very Graham. much. Thank you, Gail Deering okay. from NHS Bedford. Lovely to meet you both. Have a lovely day. Bye. Superb. Now, we've um, got... Uh, we're going off on all the tangents this morning, and I'm absolutely loving it. We've got... Uh, talking about going uh, abroad for your holiday. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Um, uh, there's no point in going on a holiday in Britain, is there, really? I mean, it, 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 it's nice for a weekend, but you won't want to spend a week or a fortnight in Britain. Or well, someone has emailed in, Flights with a small family are a nightmare with an under two without a seat and a three-year-old. It's doable. I've done it. It's doable. I vowed never to do it until they were older, which we didn't. You can't take the dog with you either. We s- Why would you want to take a dog on holiday with you? Oh, my goodness. We saw so much pretty scenery in history, which we take for granted if we don't holiday in Britain. This year we went to the highlands of Scotland and saw beautiful countryside. Oh, beautiful countryside's fine for like an hour. But then you want an arcade or you want shops. You want something. We're a beach. Look at a beach in Scotland. It's 7.15. It's Wednesday, the 10th of October. These are your headlines on BBC Three Counties Radio. Two people have been arrested at Heathrow Airport as part of an investigation into travel to Syria uh, in support of alleged terrorist activity. Uh, Jimmy Savile's headstone has been removed from his grave in Scarborough at the request of his family. 
In sport, Football Association chairman David Bernstein plans to introduce uh, a code of conduct for England players in a bid to make them behave. And coming up, we'll talk more about bingo halls. I've got a, a message as well from Ben from the JVS show. If you listen to that, Ben has sent me a very, very angry message regarding uh, beards and bingo. I shall read that shortly. More and more of the bingo halls are closing and we can't find anyone younger than 65 who plays it. BBC Three Counties Radio. Very exciting stuff. Now, there has been a driving challenge has been set. And um, I don't quite know how this was, was, was set up, but a driving challenge has been set. We, I think we were talking about bad driving habits on the show recently. And Bill Brady got in touch, who's an independent road safety consultant from Bedfordshire. And somehow a challenge came about that myself and Justin Dealey would go out, would have our driving assessed, um, and, and basically... I mean, look, we're, we're talking about a serious point about road safety and, and bad driving habits and how we can improve our road safety. But I just wanted to see that I was a better driver than Justin. I think that's how it came about. Well, we went out with Bill. I went first. You'll hear Justin driving a little bit later on after 8 o'clock, but this, this is how I got on, and I, it's pretty good, I think you'll find. I'm going to start the car. My mirrors are excellent, excellently positioned. I'm going to start the car. There we go, the car is starting. But I've got some, uh, I've got some incontinent pants on. Come on, lads, calm down, it's not going to be that bad. It's taken us 60 seconds to get out of the car park, and we're now officially on our way. I would say, though, Justin, that safety is more important than speed. Would you agree, Bill? I absolutely agree, yeah. Thank you very much. Now, you may think that I'm in the back alone, but I'm not. I'm surrounded by packets here, packets of crisps, um, lots of uh, coffee cups as well. Bill, you being a man who's got in many cars in your time, you can't be impressed with the state of this car, surely? No, it's okay. I didn't realise that you could actually hire and drive skips, but apparently you can. Uh, The thing about it, it tells me that if all these things were put in here while the car was stationary, that's good, but if they were thrown down while we are driving along, it's... It leads me to suspect the driver might not be concentrating properly. May I just say, I would never eat a pasty or a samosa whilst the vehicle was in motion. I'd always pull over and uh, have my snack. Ian's very nervous at the moment because uh, he thinks he's going to lose his driving licence if he doesn't do this right. Um, And I'll tell him him at the end whether he would have or not. Uh, A lot of it is down to your attitude as well, by the way. If you're going to start shouting at people and stuff like that, then obviously that proves that uh, your mind's not fully on the job and you're not really uh, that aware or cognizant of other people's safety. So you've got a good chance in the back there, Justin. Well, you've got your pencil and your paperwork out there ready. I'll let you crack on. Okay. We're now on Lippitz Hill in Lucerne. We've come to a stop. Bill, what's going to be happening here? We're just going to do a reverse round to the right now. Sounds simple, isn't always. Also, we're going from a, a, a one road to another. A, the one we're going into is a bit more major than the one we're coming out of. So observation is drastically important here, and we also want to park car- parallel to the curb as well. I'm sensing a real tension between us, Bill. <laughs> this is not the beautiful friendship I was expecting. I put my hazard lights on while this car approaches us. Is it? Oh, check the mirrors, check the mirrors. Everything's fine, the road's clear, everything's clear. Look, he's done it. He's done it. It's absolutely... Well done. Right, now we're going to go off left. Per- but that was perfect, wasn't it? That was very good. But it was, it was perfect. It was very good. Out of ten. Eight. Right, Stuart's inquiry. Justin Dealey edited that report. OK, we were driving around for 30 minutes. Right, 30 minutes. And he's just picked the bits that where I lost my... Ta- Someone pulled out in front of me. Of course you're going to shout at them. You're allowed to do that. I think that may even be in the highway code. I'm not totally sure. But Dealey has totally edited that in his favour. You'll hear how Justin got on in about half an hour. And if his is is all perfect and roses and lights, then we are going to have a boxing challenge. (laughs) I'm I'm really disappointed by that. Very quickly, I mentioned that uh, Ben from the JVS show, you may hear Ben on the Consumer Hour uh, chipping in. He's He's a nice lad. But, (laughs) Ian, a couple of things. One, I'm 24 and I play bingo. Wow, what? You're 24? You look about 30. My missus is from up north and she got me into it. We've even got our own dobbers. (laughs) <laughs> I know what a dobber is. It's the big marker pen, but I, for a second it left a horrible image. Uh, and number two, I also feel I have to spring to the defence of beards. I was saying I might grow a beard, but, but a lot of people with beards look a little bit pervy. I, <laughs> oh, poor Ben. I have enough aspersions cast against me by being called shabby by Jonathan Vernon Smith without having to defend my choice of facial hair on your show as well. Beards, like bingo, are cool. Thank you, Ben. Enjoy listening to you later on. Thanks. 
across beds, hearts and bugs. This is Ian Lee on BBC Three Counties Radio. 08459 455 555 is the phone number. No one sprung to the defence of holidaying in Britain, which, which can only go to prove I'm right. That holidaying in Britain, we've had one email saying it's good. One email. So you must all agree with me then that holidaying in Britain is rubbish. It's miserable, it's cold, you can't rely on the weather, there's nothing to see or do. Abroad is so much better. 08459 455 555. Now, you may have noticed your local pub or local shop closing, but what about your local bingo hall? In the past five years, more than 100 have shut. The Bingo Association say it's because they're unfairly taxed more than their online counterparts. Well, I've been trying to find anyone this morning who's under the age of 65 and admits they enjoy playing bingo. I'm not going to include Ben from the JVS show. He doesn't count. If that's you, if you are under 65 and you like a bit of bingo, could you give me a call, please? Or BBC Three Counties reporter Justin Dealey, um, who's a terrible driver, who's been out in Luton trying to convince young people to take up the game. OK, well, here's Jonathan. Jonathan, your vital stats, uh, how old are you? 18. You're wearing glasses, you look intelligent. Would you call yourself intelligent? I am. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Have you ever considered bingo before? Not really. <laughs> and tell us why. I think I'm too young for it. <laughs> And you've never been tempted before to, to play bingo? People saying to you, come on, let's go out, let's have a good bingo night. Never been tempted? My mum's tried a few times to get me to go, but I'd always say no. Ah, right, so your mum and the family are into it, but, yeah. but you're not? Yeah. <laughs> OK, I'm going to test you right now with some bingo numbers. Are you ready for this? OK. I think you might find this quite sexy. So David's den, come on, what's David's den? Ten. Correct, well done. Danny LaRue? Fifty-two. No, seventy-two. A cup of tea? Number three? Yes, well done. I can see you being a key bingo player in the future. One dozen, clearly, that's going to be 12. Lucky for some? Number one? No, that's number seven. Seven is considered a lucky number in some cultures. And I'll give you one more right now. And that would be... And the classic, come on, 88. 88, Mm. two fat ladies. Congratulations. Now, off the back of that, you clearly have a talent for this. (laughs) Would you maybe consider playing bingo? Possibly. <laughs> Quote from Justin Dealey, you wear glasses, you look intelligent. Well, Steve Baldwin is from the Dunstable Base National Bingo Association. Morning, Steve. Good morning, Ian. Why are bingo halls dwindling, Steve? I think it's as you've, you've stated this morning that um, they are and continue to be unfairly treated uh, in terms of their tax position, which is really, really unfortunate as there are uh, a considerable number of people around the UK and a significant number of them below the age of 65 who do enjoy bingo. Well, what is the tax situation then? What's, what's the problem with that? The tax position is that bingo is taxed at 20%, whereas all other gambling and gaming activities only taxed at 15 So the operators have to run their clubs and get people in under an unfair amount of additional tax. But so who's paying the tax? The people, the, the clients? It's the operators who actually run the business themselves and that therefore um, they're finding it very difficult to remain in business. Hence, over 100 have closed, as you said, in the past five years. Listen, I, I, I'm not knocking bingo. I love a bit of bingo. I used to play it with my nan and I had, I had a cracking time with it. She, was, she would get very angry if I did anything wrong. But, and Steve, quite rightly so. Steve, you can't, you can't say it's just this 5% difference in tax. That's not a big amount at all. It is, surely, because it, people perceive it, rightly or wrongly, as an old biddies game. I think there is some bingo prejudice, but I think um, you may have taken an unfortunate sample. The average age of people playing bingo these days is more likely to be about 45. It's still quite um, old. <laughs> well, I it is, your it, it, I'm Steve. personally insulted now, so early in the morning Steve, as well. I'm, I'm, I'm approaching that age and I'm old, so come on, it is 40. <laughs> you know, what I'm saying is, 45, you know, in the great scheme of things, is not that old, but 18, 19, 20-year-olds, they're not going to want to hang out with a load of 45, 50, 60-year-olds playing bingo and going, here! They're not going to want to do that, are they? I would agree with you, but I I don't think the whole of of society caters exclusively to 18, 19-year-olds. They're a very important segment of our population, but there are so many more people besides that who all need and want leisure activities and a means of coming together to create community, which is one of the other important aspects of bingo is an activity. It is an inclusive social activity, which does get people together and out of the house. I want bingo to survive, Stephen. My tongue is slightly in my cheek, but I do do want these bingo halls to survive because I I think they are a great British institution. What can we do, Steve, to make them sexy and get younger people in? 
I think lots of people just need to go and check it out. I think the majority of people assume that bingo clubs are old and dated, whereas almost all of them these days are similar to your local multiplex cinema. Mm. They've got bars, they've got diners, they offer good food at good value and the opportunity to have fun and socialise with your mates. I've got an idea. I, I don't go to bars very often, but a bar I went to recently was very, very busy, and what they had was young girls in hot pants giving out Jaeger bombs. Is that, is that a possibility? I think it's a possibility, but I do have to point out to you yes. that 73% of all bingo players are female. So providing uh, it with suitably muscly young men in hot pants, I think you might have a strong vote from the bingo audience. Steve, <laughs> I've given you a little idea. I allow you to take that away and work with it. Steve Baldwin, though, has been a good sport from the Dunstable-based National Bingo Association. Bingo's a cracking game, but younger people don't go. We need to sex up bingo. And that's my rant over. Call 08459 455 555. 08459 455 555. BBC Three Counties Radio. Good morning. Wednesday the 10th of October, 7.33, nearly. Lots coming up in the next half hour, including find out why Sir Jimmy Savile's headstone is being removed by his family. And just who is the better driver? Is it me or reporter Justin Diddy? hear more in the next half an hour if you want to get in touch you can email 3cr at bbc.co.uk text 81333 starting your text 3cr or you can give me a call 08459 455 555 let's get more now on the news that overnight the headstone of jimmy savile's grave has been removed at the request of his family the decision came shortly after police at scotland yard described the late tv star as a predatory sex offender who carried out abuse over four decades detectives say they're now investigating more than 100 lines of inquiry involving as many as 30 victims police have contacted stoke mandeville hospital hospital where he did lots of charity work our reporter, Gavin Lee, has got more details on this. Good morning, Gavin. Morning, Ian. What reasons did the family give for removing the headstone? Well, he's got three immediate surviving members of the family, so two nephews and a niece, and they issued a statement yesterday to say that because of the deep impact you know, and the of public opinion on this and how events have changed over the last you know, f- few days, literally day mm. in, day out, hearing more and more information, they have had to ask for it to be removed and you know, to keep the dignity, to keep the sanctity of the site and, and also for the others buried there. And that's key to this as well because there are two soldiers uh, buried their graves next to Jimmy Savile's grave in Sar- Scarborough overlooking the sea. One of the soldiers' families had said that they were terrified that something would happen, that this grave site would be damaged. So mm. it's a three, it's a triple headstone. It's got a, a poetry, it's got a potted history of uh, Jimmy Savile and an epitaph saying it's good while it lasted. Uh, that was removed just after midnight last uh, this morning by uh, by council workers. It's also got a spelling mistake on as well somewhere, I think. I think Chieftain is, is spelt wrong on there as well. How unusual, Gavin, is it to investigate claims when the accused is dead? Oh, massively so. I mean, yeah. there are a number of lawyers, eminent lawyers, last night saying... It, out loud questioning publicly the purpose of this inquiry, given that it can't obviously lead to Jimmy Savile's prosecution, um, how much time they said and effort should the police be spending and for what purpose. What we heard from Scotland Yard, though, was that the ultimate aim for this investigation is because there are so many claims, you know, up to 30 women between 13 and 16 years old. You mentioned 120 lines of inquiry they're looking at. They want to do this quickly. They want to work with the NSPTC uh, to see what you know, final reports they, they can bring out. So it's a compromise saying that they're assuring the victims something is being done that they can learn lessons from this but they're not tying too too much resources up just also briefly mention on the issue of um you know his work at stoke mandeville hospital i just heard from uh, the trustee this morning sylvia nickel who we're speaking to her in just a couple of minutes yes yeah, I, I was going to well i won't perceive what she says but just you know to, just um, to bring her in on this really she you know she's known jimmy Savile since the 70s and, and people like sylvia who've watched him do so much good, good mm. you know it, it must be so hard mm. it seems like different people i was listening to the family as well who initially were saying that you know he's not here to defend himself but at the same time they're having now to, to reassess everything about him how dif- i mean the, the family is who i was thinking of how, how difficult must it be for the family who are defending him yeah I, I mean, who knows what they're going through it just must be awful for them well, well that's the other thing whether or not they are defending him because you know they are open as mm. everybody else is i'm sure to this inquiry i think the issue the thing for them is is how do you cope with something mm. like this knowing somebody who's been untouchable all his life all of the good work that people knew him for has, has been you know, more than undone. It's been uh, destroyed. I'm looking at the front page of some of the papers. The Daily Mail, unmask the other BBC child abusers. There are people that are still alive that yeah. could also be part of this investigation, aren't there? 
Yeah, ultimately, this is what I suppose the, the Scotland Yard detectives will be hoping bears some fruit in terms of getting justice for the victims. If there are, you know, 30 of them, which the detectives have said have very similar, you know, comprehensive accounts of what went on over the last 40 years. Bear in mind that various names have been mentioned, celebrities included who are still alive, but there have been no formal complaints lodged. If the evidence against the individual is there, if it's credible information, then yes, it, it justifies that investigation. And just to worth, worth me saying, as well as Stoke Mandeville Hospital, Leeds General Infirmary are cooperating, as are the BBC mm. and Hortler Grand, the Children's Home in Jersey. Gavin Lee, thank you very much. Um, and we, he mentioned there Sylvia Nicholl, who is a trustee of the Jimmy Savile Charitable Trust based in Stoke Manville. We've got Sylvia on the line now. Good morning, Sylvia. Um, can I just please get, do. get the name of the trust right? Please do. Jimmy Savile Stoke Mandeville Hospital Trust. OK. Um, he ran two trusts, you see. OK. Are you going to change that name? Um... Until I attend the trustees meeting on the 22nd of um, this month, I don't know. Mm. Um, we need to meet and we're meeting on the 22nd. How are you feeling at the moment, Sylvia? Because you I, knew Jimmy. I feel... <laughs> it's difficult to say how you feel. Mm. I feel sad. I feel... <sighs> I feel bereaved, really. Mm. And just so unhappy. Well, and you're not denying that these allegations have any foundation whatsoever? You... Oh, oh, I... No, I, I mean, I can only know that they're all happening, mm -hmm. and uh, of course I'm hoping for a police and a BBC inquiry, and as soon as possible immediate i hope mm. oh yeah because well the police inquiry they, they're, they're keen to do as quickly quick and as fast as they can yeah. you know do what they can um, have you spoken it's got to be obviously have you spoken to other members of the trust um to other members of the trust to his friends from leeds his friends in ellsbury at stoke Mandeville hospital and they they all feel like me we're how do you feel, you know, when you're suddenly confronted, it's like suddenly being told that a member of your family was a murderer, you know, yeah. how, how do you get through that and know how you feel? I only know that in 38 years, I didn't see anything like that. Mm. And if you, if you did, you know, you would report it immediately and um and I guess that's that, that, that from what I little I know about uh, the, the paedophiles uh, that that's part, part of their <coughs> excuse me skill in inverted commas is, is leading almost a double life isn't it it's, it's being able to keep to present a public image to people and friends and family while still committing you know heinous crimes well I don't know anything about that hopefully in my life I, I've, I'd know nothing about no. So I wouldn't be able to comment on that. So, Sylvia, when, when is the meeting you're having with the other trust the members? 22nd. And, and what's going to be discussed then? Well, I should imagine quite a lot of things. Mm. It's, you're going to have to take his name out, aren't and you? And obviously That's... changes and, yeah. and so on. You're going to have to drop his name, aren't you? You, you, well, you can't keep on with that well, name I now. Well, I can't, again, I can't comment on that because I've got to wait and see what they okay. all say. Can we speak to you after the 22nd, Sylvia, to see what happens? If you like, yeah. We'd like to, listen, and, and best of luck with whatever you choose to do. Thank you. Thank you, Sylvia. That's Sylvia Nicholl from the Jimmy Savile Stoke Mandeville Hospital Charitable Trust. They're going to have to drop that name, aren't they? Even if, 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 you know, Jimmy Savile comes out clean as a whistle, which is looking unlikely, but even if he does, it, there's just so much associated, so much nastiness associated with that name now that um, they can't keep that, can they? Right, um, we were talking... <coughs> it is amazing on this kind of show, isn't it? And this is why I love doing this kind of show, how you flip from one topic to the next. So we go from Jimmy Savile, we go to Bingo. And I'm trying to find someone under the age of 65 who plays Bingo. A lot of Bingo halls are closing. They're saying it's because of the unfair tax that's placed on them. I think it's more because it's seen as an old biddy's game. And I'm trying to find someone under the age of 65 who likes a bit of Bingo. Colin Tindunstable. Good morning, Colin. Rubbish. I beg your pardon? Rubbish. Well, what are you talking it's about? It's not an old biddies game at all. You sound old. Uh, I am now, but well, there when you I... you go. <laughs> I'm not that old. I'm uh, 55. Well, it's quite old. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. 
Um, <laughs> go, go on. You can go off people very quickly, you know. <laughs> did Ian. you play when you were a younger man, Colin? I did, yes. I played when I was in my sort of 20s and 30s. Right. Um, what, was the, was, what was the attraction for you? Well, it was a good night out. I could eat, I could drink. Because um, I didn't, I got the coach to the bingo station yep. that was uh, laid on for us. Yeah. Um, I went with a, a mixed crowd. Yeah. Um, and was it a good place to pick up? Enjoyed it. Was it a good place to pick up the ladies? No. Oh, okay. They were, they were too busy dubbing away, were they? Yeah. Oh, that's, a, that's the problem. Um, but it was a good social event. Why did you stop going then? Um, change of lifestyle and various things. Okay, that's um, mysterious. But, uh, one of them was that, um, um, uh, you weren't allowed to smoke. Oh, and thank goodness for that! Isn't um, that great they banned smoking in bingo halls? Sorry? Isn't it great that they banned smoking in bingo halls? No. You used to literally have a cloud is, uh, hovering above everybody. Yeah, but I'm a smoker. I, I guess. I, I would say at least <laughs> half of them were. Yeah. Um, you know, and, um... You're not still a smoker now, are you, Colin? Yes. Oh, please. Do you stop it? Stop smoking. No, I've tried. You sound about 65, not 55. Well, I, I feel about 65 Oh, bless well. you. Well, if you stop smoking, honestly, your voice would clear up, you'd feel younger, oh, your no, skin no, would no, clear no, up. No, no, no. You wouldn't no. have those horrible yellow fingers you've got? Oh, I don't care. I'd rather die happy. <laughs> well, there you go. If, if they reintroduce smoking into bingo halls, would you go along? Possibly, yeah. And what can we do? Final question, Colin. What can we do to make bingo sexy for the youngsters? I think it's... It, it's I mean, there's a, a, a high degree of, uh, of winning. Yeah. Um, that's what attracted me What's well. the most, most you ever won? A uh, couple of hundred. Yeah, a few years ago. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Can you give us give us uh, your your best bingo shout when you've won? I'm, I'm going to call your last number, Colin. Oh you need, dear, I, you no, need... Colin. No. I, I Colin. Was, I was never uh, I was never uh, that outgoing. Colin, I'm going to call number twenty nine. That's the last number you need to complete everything. I want you to shout. Okay, nice and loud, so I know you've won. Go on then. Two and eight, twenty eight. Three and six, thirty six. Four and two, forty-two. Two fat ladies, eighty-eight. Two and nine, twenty-nine. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Colin. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> what a good sport, Colin and Dunstable. Stop going in his thirties. Doesn't count though, because he's he's older now. I want someone under sixty-five who plays now. Seven forty-five, Wednesday, the tenth October. These are your headlines this morning on BBC Three Counties Radio. Counter-terrorism police have arrested a man and a woman at Heathrow Airport as part of an investigation into travel to Syria in support of alleged terrorist activity. British farmers are predicting a rise in the cost of food as a result of the wet weather in the spring and summer. In sport, Andy Murray begins the defence of his Shanghai Masters title today against Germany's Florian Meyer in a second round match. And your weather across beds, huts and bucks. A chilly, misty start, then fine and dry with sunny spells and a top temperature of 14 degrees. Coming up, you can hear Justin Dealey on a driving course. And I tell you what, he will not be better than me. BBC Three Counties Radio. Now, television presenter Justin Lee Collins has been found guilty of harassing his former partner, Anna Luck. A jury at St Albans Crown Court agreed he'd subjected her to sustained emotional and domestic abuse. He's been given 140 hours of community service. Hamish Brown, MBE, worked for Scotland Yard for over 30 years. He was awarded the MBE in the Queen's Birthday Honours list for his services to victims of harassment. Good morning, Hamish. And good morning to you. What's the legal definition of harassment? Well, there really isn't one, but what it includes is alarm or distress. And this is important to consider this because harassment, or sometimes it's called stalking, it's often acts in isolation which usually aren't criminal offences. I know there were slaps, so there were some crimes here, but usually it's not criminal offences, but it's the totality of the behaviour that counts. Putting everything together, that's where it digs in. So you need to think outside the box when you're dealing with stalking or harassment because you might not have a specific crime to deal with. So it's, it's a cumulative, so a, a, a slightly abusive phone call late one night on its own 
it will probably just stand as that. But if that involved emails and turning up at people's door uh, over a period of time, that could be classed as harassment. Yes, that's right, and people can do some quite crafty things which actually beggars belief. I don't want to give everything away, of course, and give people ideas, but there's some things which are commonplace, like sending unwanted cabs to people or pizza deliveries. I mean, that's not a crime in itself, yeah. but it's pretty annoying and actually upsetting, quite spooky, if this keeps on happening. So that's what the public and the police must understand. And in fact, although in many cases they do a good job, the police, there have been some shortcomings with this sort of comment, we'll come back when he's done something. Well, that's not mm. good enough. They've got to know the effect this can have on people, the emotional abuse, which you started with your introduction. That's a good, a good beginning. I took someone to court for harassing me, and it was the things you said. It was, it was There was abusive texts and tweets and stuff like that, but it was also uh, pizzas being delivered and, and loads of stuff being delivered. It's really difficult to prove, isn't it? Well, any case has got to be proved beyond reasonable doubt, and stalking and harassment is, is no exception. So look at the evidence. And what I would say is if someone is in this unhappy position and they are getting letters, do keep them, put them to one side, make a note of what's going on, if someone's with you, even better, and how you felt about it. Because if it comes to making a statement, perhaps some months later, or you might say, well, I think it was the middle of March, but it's better to say, well, it's actually on the 14th of March mm. at 2pm, he was standing there. And I've just said, I just caught myself out, I said, he, it normally is men stalking women, but women can and do stalk men, and we can have same-sex stalking as well, but predominantly it is men stalking women. Hamish, I know you've got a busy day. We'll let you go. Hamish Brown, uh, MBE, worked at Scotland Yard for over 30 years. There was a story in the paper, wasn't there? Uh, I think yesterday, a couple of days ago, an actress, I think, from Holby, who'd had a female stalker. Um, and it can happen, and it's not very nice when it happens to you. Uh, my, my, uh, anyway, my thing happened, and it was, it was quite unpleasant as it went on. Uh, later on, JVS will be discussing this on the phone-in uh, on his show after nine. He'll Join me in the studio in about, well, I don't know, 25 minutes or so to let us know what his big question is today. 08459 455 555 is the telephone number if you want to give me uh, a call. Cats and dogs, we've been talking about. Fat pets. If you ever feed your, your, your pet, that's abuse. Uh, I, I'm a cat owner. I've owned a dog before, but cats are so much better than dogs. And I just think... Th- th- I'm, I'm always mistrustful of people with dogs. There's just something not quite right about them. If, you, if I were to, to die in my house and there was no one else there, right, and I had a dog, the dog would lie by me until it died. If I had a cat, the cat would eat me. Now, that's, that, that's sense. That was common sense. That means cats are more intelligent than dogs. Dogs are so stupid. Uh, if you're going to email or, or text, do put your name on. This one's anonymous. Ian, we have a cat and a dog. You can't say either one is better. It's purely a personal choice. No, I can. Cats is better than dogs. If we want to have a cuddle with our pets, the dog comes when called. The cat, if he feels like it. Well, you've got a dodgy cat, then. Walking the dog gets you to meet other people. Yeah, that other dog owners. The cat is great if you can't get out and about. The insurance is about the same for both. Our cat and dog love each other, but the dog ain't too happy when the cat pads his claws in her fur. Um, Ian, I've got a Yorkie from Esther. A Yorkie called Yoda, named as such because he can lift uh, spaceships out of swamps. No, because he's unusually big ears and he looks like Yoda out of Star Wars. He welcomes me home, comes for a cuddle and barks when the door knocks. How annoying is that? I don't need someone telling me the door is knocking. I can hear the door is knocking. Um, he also tells the cats off when they scra- uh, have a fight. So I'm going to stand up for my Yoda, the smartest dog I know. Esther, you're so misguided. Dogs, dogs are just uh, very, very suspicious about them. Now, uh, we were talking about bad driving habits on the show recently, and Bill Brady got in touch. He's an independent road safety consultant from Bedfordshire. He challenged myself and our reporter, Justin Dealey, to a driving test. Would we still pass if we took the test now? Who is the best driver? Earlier on, you heard me using my skills to drive around the streets of Luton. If you missed it, here's a recap of both my good and, apparently, atrocious driving. Is it? Oh, check the mirrors, check the mirrors. Everything's fine, the road's clear, everything's clear. Look, he's done it. He's done it. It's absolutely... Well done. Right, now we're going to go off left. Per- but that was perfect, wasn't it? That was very good. But it was, it was perfect. It was very good. Out of ten? I, and I'll tell that you... That idiot! Uh, a lot of it is down to your attitude oh, as well, by the way. If you're going to start no, shouting no, at people no. and stuff like I'm, that... I'm going to stop that, because that's, that's been edited very, very unfairly. I don't, I don't, I'm not going to play that out on my show. There's it's, it's not, it's not, it's not the true representation of what happened. Let's listen to Justin's. Now, remember, I was in the car with Justin. I know exactly what happened. He has edited this package... I will tell you the truth afterwards. Let's have a listen. I've been driving in my car. Okay, 
we're, we're driving along. One thing I've noticed already, Bill, is... Justin's really using a lot of revs on the engine. Is that is that acceptable? Well, it's probably what he normally does. You know, when he's when he's uh, not concentrating, he's concentrating at the moment. So he's uh, he's making sure it all goes right. Can we have silence in the car, please? I'm trying to concentrate. <laughs> Sorry, Justin. Carry on. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt, chaps. Um, really enjoying the journey. Uh, one thing that struck me is is I normally go for the ten to two position on the steering wheel, very occasionally the uh, quarter past three, but uh, the, but I'm impressed to see Justin, you're adopting. Let me work that out, the twenty five past six steering hold. The uh, hand position was noted right at the very beginning, but as I said to you today, I'm not here to instruct you. I'm here to see what you're doing, uh, and then tell you at the end whether it was right or not. <laughs> Look. <laughs> Look at the subtle move of hands there. Well done, Justin. You're paying attention. Carry on. Just just slow down to, to the speed limit or thereabouts. Good luck. OK, we're going for the uh, tricky right-hand reverse that I did pretty well. Got an 8 out of 10 for it when I did it twice. Justin, you feeling confident? Oh, very confident. Very, very confident. OK, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to commentate as you, as you go ahead. So one thing he has done that I failed to do is put on his hazard light. Justin is looking round. He's giggling like a girl makes this double tricky is there is actually a sign on the road will justin notice this or will he hit it okay he's not hit the sign but he's come very very close that was very that. good i think that was nine out of ten that <laughs> hang on a minute bill what was what was better about that one go no i did no i did it in one go you demanded a second go but the first go was perfect you were stuttering as you went round. justin wasn't he was perfect oh, thank you bill sorry about that ian i did warn you unbelievable Okay, we've both finished our driving. So are we safe drivers? This is the serious aspect of it. Are we safe on the roads? We never hit anything on the way round, but there was a lot of points from both of you, uh, which I won't go into at the moment, uh, where there was a potential for a collision. Some of the some of the manoeuvres were very good. Um. Some of them were very poor. I'm not happy with the way that was edited. Because right? Justin drove for about tw- 25, 30 minutes. Uh, <sighs> I'm not happy with that in the slightest. That was Justin Daly with Bill Brady, an independent road safety consultant from Bedfordshire. Bill is on the line now. Good morning, Bill. Good morning, Just Ian. let you know, Justin is here. At the... Justin. Hello, Ian. Those pieces were edited very, very unfairly. Well, in your opinion, I yes. don't want to sound like a bitter Big Brother contestant mm, saying yeah. I was manipulated, <laughs> but flipping heck, mate, come on. Oh, come on, you are busy. You see, at the end of the day, it's a bit like these people who go on these reality TV shows saying, oh, it was all in the edit. Well, that's exactly <laughs> what you did. Don't you dare blame the edit now. Yeah, OK, well, listen, Justin, neither of us know who was the better driver. Bill is going to reveal kind of some bits where we did well, some bits where we did, did badly, and then I think you're probably going to end up crying. Bill, <laughs> how, how did we get on? Ser- and we, we, we're joking a bit. There is a serious side to this. It's about road safety. How did we get on? All right, look, seriously, I've left for you there. Hopefully you've got them now. A certificate to say that you both actually completed this run round. OK. OK, because it was re- you're really good sports to come out and do this. I have the certificate, yes. Right, who won? <laughs> now look, there's only two things you can ever criticise drivers, uh, men for, is either the size of their equipment or their driving. Steady on, Bill Brady, what are you talking right. about, yes. It was a cold morning, so we didn't look at equipment, we just yes. looked at driving. Thank you. All right. <laughs> we, had, we had an hour of this, ladies and gentlemen, trust me, it got, it got tedious. <laughs> you, uh, you would both benefit, honestly, from uh, looking at a bit of a transport. <laughs> oh, very, I knew that was coming. Very tactfully done, thank you. <laughs> All right, and, and also, by the way, you can let your listeners know out there that any, any uh, young drivers between 17 and 24 that have passed their test, uh, we, we're happy to, uh, in ROSPA, to let them join our group for one pound and train oh. them for a year to uh, be advanced drivers. And do they, they get a few quid off their, their insurance, don't they, if they, if they do if that? If they get the right insurance come, they certainly do that. Fantastic. Well, that's got to be worth doing. Now, when you went round, there was... Uh, w- you remember, I'm not uh, a, a driving examiner for the DSA. I was just looking at... I was basing on what you do uh, on a driving test, OK? Mm-hmm. Yes. I'm looking at all the points that they look for in a driving test. OK. Who's the best? All right. If you get 16 minor faults, yeah. you fail. Yeah. If you get one serious or dangerous manoeuvre, you fail. None of the two of you did that, or she'd have been back straight away. That's fantastic. Okay. I'm so nervous, Justin. Terry, <laughs> <laughs> right. too. You wanted a true verdict, didn't you? Yes, we did, yes, Bill, yes. yes. Okay, minor faults. Ian. Yep. 11. Okay, 11's not bad. So you would have passed the learner driver test. Easily, yes, thank you. Justin. So, yes. What you did was you made the mistake when we were coming back of thinking we'd finished the assessment. <sighs> so when you went on then to uh, 
at one time drive with no hands. Oh, ho, 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 Justin did a no-hander. And you revert to style the way you normally drive. You I've ended been stitched up, with... up here. I've been stitched up. Justin, let Bill. We, listen, Bill, we've only got about thirty seconds. Bill, carry on. Justin's going to be quiet. Carry on. Seventeen minor <laughs> faults. So, hang on a minute. Just, Bill, you're saying that Justin would have failed his driving test if he'd taken one? If he'd have taken it on that guy. Hey, So, Ooh. just to clarify, Bill, I was the best driver by quite a, a, a big distance. A fair bit, yeah. Justin, would you like to apologise? Uh, no, no, no apologies. Uh, Bill, um, I have to say, I, I don't think this, this was quite fair. Uh, as I mentioned, it was the third... Oh, I'm, I'm really sorry. We seem to have lost Justin's line there, Bill. I don't know... <laughs> I don't know what happened there. It was a bit like his edit, wasn't it? A, bit, a little bit. I don't know what... Oh, dear, seems to have gone. Bill, listen, you have been a cracking sport. Very, very quickly. You've got ten seconds. Just give us how, how those young people can get in touch with Rossborough again. Uh, all got, you've got my details there, yep. three counties. If they give us a bell, then we'll let them know what it's all about. Or they can go onto the website, uh, the ROAR, the Rossborough Advanced Drivers Group website, and they can join from uh, the enrolment form on the website. Bill, you're a cracking sport. Thank you so much. Cheers. Cheers, mate. There we go. Bill Brady. Fantastic. Yes! Totally destroyed D. Lee. What's next? Yeah, I'm still laughing at Justin D. Lee. He, he only did it for a little bit, BBC and uh, Daily Mail, but he did do a little bit of no-handed driving. What an awful man. We'll, we'll make sure he has some more lessons. Don't worry, the roads of Beds, Hearts and Bucks will be safe again. Let's get the latest news and sport now. Here's Catherine Boyle. <laughs> Morning, dear listener. This is Ian Lee, BBC Three Counties Radio. Even I sounded surprised when I said that. I've got no idea why. Plenty coming up in the next hour of the show before Jonathan Vernon Smith starts at nine o'clock, including 350 million people worldwide have got mental health problems. We'll look into why. Pet lovers, you're killing your animals with kindness. And bingo halls keep closing. Does anybody under 65 go to them anymore? You can email 3cr at bbc.co.uk. You can text 81333, starting your text 3CR, or you can give me a call 08459 455 555. BBC Three Counties Radio. Now, it's World Mental Health Day, so all morning we've been taking a look at the mental health service in the three counties. Across the world, it's estimated that more than 350 million people are affected of all ages and all backgrounds. So Beds and Luton Mind aim to support people with mental health uh, needs across Bedfordshire. To do this, they run workshops and projects from art to country walks. Our reporter, Sophie Solaria, went along to the Monday Photography Club in Bedford to see some of the work they do. My name's Janice, Janice Scott. I run the Wellbeing Centre. Now, the Wellbeing Centre was put together two years ago. We started off as an information point, and from there we have now developed into a, a fully running Wellbeing Centre. We have a drop-in for anybody with any mental health concerns to come in, including carers, people that are suffering themselves or other, other agencies. So tell me a bit about the work you do then. OK, well, today we've actually got the Bebbish and Luton Mind group running, so if you'd like to come through, Lovely. I will introduce you to our photography group that's running. Great. Hello. Hi, Paul. Hiya. So you're doing some photography here today? What we do, basically, is we have a class here every week, um, and the, the group bring in their own pictures, and what we do is we upload them, we put them in files and stuff like that, and then we work on them in Photoshop. I'll show you what Chris has just done here. This is actually a picture of a... Is it a tawny owl? No, it's a barn owl. Oh, a barn owl. Yeah. So where did you have that taken, Chris? Shotworth College. And you took it yourself? Yeah, yeah. We put a box around it. Cropping it, yeah. Cropping it. We've taken all that out. And what um, else have you done? You've used... The brightness contrast. It really does look like a different picture. Yeah. It's, it's so exciting, the different things you can get, and um, I just love it. How has it helped you? It's very therapeutic, yeah. It takes my mind off things, and, yeah, I just enjoy coming every week. I love it. It's like socialising, really. For a lot of people, it's a, it's a reason to come out of the house... You know, they, they, when we come here, we do tend to have quite a good laugh, don't we, Chris? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we do, we have fun. We work together as well as a group. We normally have a projector up, so people are actually observing what other people are doing. So, you know, we sort of contribute together. So it's, it's you know, it's like a you know, good group involvement, really. Okay. Janice, we've just witnessed a, an, a, an art class or a photography class in there. People seem to really enjoy themselves. Oh, yes, when they come here, there's lots of things for people to do. We don't just do photography. We have art, creative writing, relaxation... <coughs> music, 
cookery over the, the six hours a week that we have the group running. It brings them together with people that understand them, and I think that's the most important thing for them. It's just a nice, easy atmosphere for them to learn to recover and to learn things and, and move forward. Well, joining me now is Caroline Holman and Janice Scott from Beds and Luton Mine. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you very much for coming in. Now, Janice, um, it's, you're joining in with World Mental Health Day today, and there's going to be a procession through Luton Town. Tell me about that. Yes, well, we're starting off in Luton. We're starting off in Luton. Um, we're starting at quarter past nine. Yep. We've got a banner, um, which has got our slogan on, which is... Oh, you've forgotten the slogan? I've forgotten the slogan. <laughs> oh, my goodness, Janice. <laughs> Just gone out of my head. Um, carrying the torch for the invisible disability. Right. And what are you hoping to achieve with the procession? What we want to do is raise everybody's awareness that mental health isn't something to be scared of, mm. that we need to get rid of the stigma that, and the discrimination against um, it, mental health. Uh, we were talking about the stigma earlier on, and I, 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 I kind of struggle a bit to understand it. I, I guess because a lot of the times when we hear words like schizophrenia or bipolar, it's often uh, a, a horrible story in the newspaper about someone who stabbed someone. And that seems to be the only time Th- those conditions get any kind of, you know, treatment in the press. Is, yeah. is that why there's a stigma or are there other reasons I as well? I think that's very much part of yeah. it. Um, the media always wants to pick up on the bad side of it. They're mm. not very good at picking up on the good side. And I think... It, is there a good side to mental health? There is a good illness? side to mental health. A lot of people with mental health issues have incredible talents mm. and often coming through a mental health illness, they learn a lot more about themselves and they maybe move on and do different things that they wouldn't have done before. Caroline, is it true you're not going to be in the procession? But I'm not. Yes. No, I'm doing some other things today. Well, well, but hang on a second. Come on, there's a big procession going on. Why, why are you, you bottling out of it? What's the problem? We have an information point at Luton Library, right. uh, which operates twice a week. We're launching that today at 10 o'clock, so I'm going to be at that event. Okay. And then I'm going down to Bedford where there's an art work, w- walk, looking at work which um, people with mental health needs have created. Mm. And then I'll be at Pigeon Square in Bedford, ready for when the procession I will arrives. let you off then. You've, got, you. you've got a full and busy day. You are excused. You've brought a, a, an excellent uh, note. So this, what was this the thing you were saying about in the library that's happening at, at 10 o'clock? What, what is that? In partnership with Luton Culture, mm. um, Bevshire and Luton Mind now on a Tuesday and a Thursday um, between 12 and 2 have an information point mm. there so people can come into the library and come and find out about anything to do with their mental well-being so we can offer support and early intervention. What kind of people come to that? Because I would imagine that in the early stages of uh, a, a mental illness, and again I speak as someone who suffers from depression, you kind of just think oh, well, well, there's nothing anyone can do. There's nothing wrong. Well, are people prepared to come along and, and talk in the early stages that's why it's so good that we're in a public place so some people yeah. will just go into the library and then notice we're there and start to talk mm. um, a lot of people will come along when they do realize that they're having those early signs and get that get the help then which is so important janice a lot of cuts to uh, uh, mental health services how do people continue to work through that I might have to pass this over to Caroline. Caroline, she's a lot of cuts side. in mental yeah. health services. <laughs> how, how do you work through that? Because it's, it's got to be, there's <laughs> lots of cuts everywhere. It's got to be a problem, isn't it? Um, there are a lot of cuts, but there's a lot of cuts for, for everybody, mm. um, not just in mental health. Um, we are very fortunate that we have an awful lot of volunteers who support our services. Okay. They really are the, This is mine specifically, yes. yeah. yeah. Um, they're the main thing which keep us going and allow us to give much more value for the money we do receive. Mm. So a, a lot of it's down to volunteers. There could be, be more cuts in the future as well. I mean, how much money do you get from the government, if any? Do you get any? Yes, no, we do. We yeah. do. We, we, we are supported. Um, and the people who fund us um, talk to us and give us an opportunity really to prove what we do mm. so that we can secure our funding. We also look at where there are needs in the community and we can pull down funding from other places. We've recently just got a grant from Comet Relief, mm. Department of Health. Um, but so, so it must be a constant struggle though to get enough money to keep things ticking over. It, it is, um, but we also work in partnership with other organisations like Loot and Culture, uh, the Mental Health Trust and other voluntary sector to really try and bring much more value to people. Janice, we're talking mainly about depression because that's, that's the theme of, of World Mental Health Day uh, today, I think, is, it seems to be the thing. And there will be people listening to this, and I've met these people, uh, who, who say, oh, depression, oh, for goodness sakes. Pull you, come on, pull, we all get a bit down from time. Just, just man up a little bit. What would you say to those people? I'd say to those people... You've never actually suffered from depression, if that's what you believe. If you've got a relative or a friend or anybody that suffers with 
with, with depression where they become totally isolated. They lose um, all contact with, with life. Often they will not wash, they will not get out of bed. They, they lose all quality of life. With that follows on the lack of confidence. As that grows, they become unable to do less you know un- un- unable to do anything mm. often people lose their jobs things happen in life which makes which which makes us um worried and not sure how to deal with it become stressed the stress develops the depression because we don't know how to find our way out of it and that's what Bedford and Luton Mind do we're there to help people to find their way out of their depression there's lots of ways of of, of doing this one of them is activity. Hmm. Physical exercise is one of the best things for depression. Hmm. Doesn't work for everyone. Doesn't work for everyone. But it can be a but big. It can be a big. If someone is is, is worried that, that they might be suffering from clinical depression or a friend or relative is, what would you suggest they do? I would suggest that they would go on the Mind website, find their local Mind, and um, contact us. We do have a drop in as well in Bedford at the Bedford Wellbeing Centre. Mm-hmm. People can come in and see us at any time between 9 and 4 on weekdays and 10 and 1 on Saturdays. And there's someone there that will talk to them, give them information, signpost them to where they need to be. Can they get a cup of tea there? They will get a cup of tea. That's the thing. It's always (laughs) the important thing. Listen, if you want people to come to your places, just make sure there's a good cup of tea available. There we go. I told you that would be quick, didn't I? That would be over before you knew it. Thank you very much for coming in. Uh, Caroline Holman and Janice Scott from Beds and Luton Mine. Thank you very much. I hope the day goes well for you. What's the weather like out there this morning? Sun is shining. Perfect. You can't argue with that. Thank you very much. Best of luck. 08459 455 555 is the telephone number if you want to give me a call. We've been talking as well a little bit about holidays. Why would anyone want to holiday in Great Britain, for goodness sakes? Well, uh, Jill has uh, texted in. We holidayed in Cornwall with two teenagers, the in-laws and two Labradors. We had a great week, even though the weather wasn't great, but then just the hubby and me sneaked away two months later for a week in Greece. Don't knock the UK holiday. Hang on a second, Jill. You said don't knock the UK holiday, and then you went off for a proper holiday in Greece. You, you, You can't say that. We had a holiday with all the family, then we snuck off for a while in Greece. Greece is a great place to go to holiday. Oh, it's a fantastic place. Uh, George Shepherd from Wing. We spent last two weeks in Cornwall. It was fantastic. Plenty to see and visit. Good food, great beer. No airport queues, lost tickets, passports or luggage. And as for the weather, I'm sure you'll mention it. Go prepared for the worst and then the good weather is a bonus. But why should you be prepared for the worst? Uh, But then, George goes on to say, holidays abroad are great. Oh, as it keeps the quiet parts of this country quiet for us. Listen, Cornwall's fantastic and gorgeous, but you just can't... If I go on holiday, I want to know it's going to be warm. It's 8.15 Wednesday, the 10th of October. These are your headlines this morning on BBC Three Counties Radio. Farmers are predicting food prices will rise this winter because of poor harvests due to the unusual weather earlier this year. Members of the Sir Jimmy Savile Stoke Mandeville Trust in Buckinghamshire will meet to discuss the charity's future in the wake of child abuse allegations. In sport, Saracens are due to hold a fans forum at Old Albanian's RFC tonight from half past seven. Maybe someone could tell me what a fans forum is. I've got literally no idea. And coming up, no one holidays in the UK anymore. But why would you want to? Abroad is so much better. Hear from the head of tourism in Buckinghamshire. BBC Three Counties Radio. Jonathan, <laughs> you're so, so naughty. I know. Jonathan Vernon-Smith is joining me in the studio, and you've been on holiday. Would you ever go on holiday in the UK? No. It, what, a weekend away in the country. Oh, nice yes. little cottage, lovely. I like, I like it. I like, um, do you know what's very underrated? Weekend in Kent. Sorry? You're going to have a lot of fun in Kent. Doing what? Well, there's some beautiful parts of Kent. Go to Canterbury, go to Sandwich... Go down to Royal Tunbridge Wells. You sold it to me. When are we going? Uh, it's no, listen. This is not another date <laughs> that you're never going to fulfil. I'm going to I'm, I'm going to send you some dates to go shooting with you. Re- okay. Yes, but you wouldn't you wouldn't want to spend more than three days in Britain on a holiday? No, no, because it rains. Yeah. I mean, I live here. I love this country. I, I, I love living here. I'm not knocking yeah. that in the slightest. And it's not you know there are lots of things to do for a weekend. You can go off on a Saturday and go and visit some stately home and yep. go off and do this. But you're quite right. What you say. I mean, the thought of a two week holiday in oh, England. Jeez. 
I, I have memories, because my grandmother used to live down in Devon, and we used yeah. to have to go down there for like a week. Beautiful part of the world. Yeah, beautiful part of the world. We used to spend most of the, uh, the week sitting in the car, sheltering from the rain, <laughs> next to the beach. <laughs> I remember those holidays, Eating yes. our sandwiches. Yeah, yeah. Were, it was all designed, you know, we were going to spend a day on the beach, but yeah. it was pouring with rain so we'd end up in the in the back of the mazda 626 but you go to greece you go to spain you go to certain parts of america you know that you're going to get sunny weather but it's perfect you can plan everything yeah. around that and yeah. there's more there's better food there's more it, it's great to go abroad my recent holiday in frigiliana the first day it was terrible yeah. it was raining because they had all those terrible floods down in spain it was yes. awful yes um but i knew when i arrived there, i thought this won't last yeah of course sure enough it didn't the next morning beautiful sunshine for the rest of the week. Fantastic. Had my mankini on, it was Ooh, beautiful. Oh dear. What's on your show this morning? Coming up on the big phone in today, is leaving an abusive relationship easier said than done? Uh, the comedian and TV presenter Justin Lee Collins has been found guilty of harassing his former girlfriend. St Albans Crown Court heard that Anna Lark from Purton in Hertfordshire sustained emotional and domestic abuse during their relationship. They were together for seven months and there will be people wondering why it lasted that long. But anyone who's experienced an abusive relationship will be aware that it can be hard to end it. Well, from nine this morning, I want to hear your experiences. Is leaving an abusive relationship easier said than done? If you yourself have been in an abusive relationship, was it difficult to leave? Have you tried to help a friend or a family member leave an abusive relationship? Was it very difficult? 08459 455 555. We'll discuss it on the big phone in this morning at nine. I shall be listening, Justin. Thank you very much. Jonathan. Jonathan. I did that one deliberately. I was just to see if you were listening. For goodness sakes. <laughs> See you later on. Ta ta. Oh wait, four five nine four double five five double five. That was a deliberate one. Yeah. Get out. Um, d- don't call him Justin or Jeremy. He gets very, very upset. Very upset indeed. Oh wait, four five nine four double five five double five is the telephone number. Now, no one wants to holiday at home, do they? Visit Britain will today launch its biggest consultation yet to overhaul the tourism industry. I beg your pardon. So uh, we're. Uh, we're well, whether, I do apologise. Look, I'm, 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 Chris, I do apologise. I was jumping ahead of you, <laughs> and you're sat there waiting to do the weather. How rude of me. Oh. Do, you, do you still want to do the weather, or do you want to hear about tourism in Britain? Well, I guess it's kind of related, isn't it? I, I, let, I tell you what, let me play your bed, and then you can do your bit. Here you <laughs> All go. All right. Snatch your BBC Radio three, or three counties. Oh, 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 see, listen, we, we I are did both. It. Have you done that before? No, sir, because I'm not oh. a fool. Well, I do six different radios for the BBC, and all of them oh, have radio in them somewhere, except for this off. one. Chris Bell, lovely to speak to you. Thank you very much indeed. We're quits now, Chris. Back to what I was talking about, how no one wants to holiday at home. Visit Britain today is going to launch its biggest consultation yet to overhaul the tourism industry. It's trying to reach a new target of 40 million visitors by 2020. Well, Karen Roebuck is head of marketing for Tourism Southeast, which promotes Buckinghamshire as a tourist destination. Good morning, Karen. Good morning. No one wants to holiday in Britain, though, do they? Abroad is so much better. Well, you, you just both, I was just listening to both of you chatting there, and yes. I'd like to give, extend you an invitation to come and spend a week in the South East, and actually you'll find mm. a completely different picture. I've just spent a week in the South East, and I think what you're missing is that it's more, a more inclusive holiday. With, the trend is for these extended family holidays. So I went with my children who are in their 20s, and with my grandchildren, and we had a fantastic week. Yes, it rained probably every day, but not all day, oh. and you have a different type of holiday. We have a, a, a wet holiday. If I go to Greece, then I know it's going to be sunny. I'm going to get some fantastic food, some amazing beaches, some of the best history in the world. What, is, what has the South East got to offer? Well, actually, you've got fantastic history. Um, in Buckinghamshire alone, you've got some unique history, like Waddesdon Manor, for instance, um, and you've got um, Roald Dahl Museum. So what very, very um, interested uh, for children, the Roald Dahl Museum is one of our most popular places for family visits. You've also got the Chilterns. You know, you've got outstanding natural beauty on your doorstep. Um, and in the wider southeast, the heritage is the, the top, I think that we probably offer you Windsor Castle, the our leave. Um, you've got the the universities of Oxford. We have so much heritage here. Buckinghamshire is having some success with foreign visitors. China, I believe. 
Yes, we've been working in China for seven years. Um, Waterston has been, and Hartwell House actually, they've been the sort of main partners. But um, this year, the, the Buckinghamshire itself has actually um, taken on board the work we're doing and got very involved with us. And we've developed a 48 hours in Buckinghamshire. Because obviously, uh, when you've got an international visitor, they won't stay a week in one place. They'll do a tour. So what we're trying to develop is that the fact that there, is, there are things to do where you can stay overnight. Um, and China has been one of our more successful countries that we've been working with. You're going to and China in November, aren't you? I am, yes. Visit Britain organised a um, number of a trade jolly. events. I, I wish it was. <laughs> I do. Well, this particular one, I'm doing 30 appointments, but the one I do wow. earlier on in the year, I do 60 appointments in two days. Wow. So I don't think, it's a bit like speed dating. Gosh. Um, so what do you do? So you go and meet different like, mayors and ambassadors and tell, tell them why they should come to Bucks? No, this, these particular ones are very much aimed at the trade. So right. tour operators, travel agents, um, people that bring coach groups over, all of these people are the people that we are, are very interested in. And also the media. So, for instance, we host... Um, We've hosted uh, Chinese journalists just recently, actually, into Buckinghamshire as well. Um, and we've got a group coming in in, in the next, uh, I'm just thinking next week, we've got a group of um, journalists doing Berkshire, Buckinghamshire and Oxfordshire, and they're looking for hidden gems. So it's not always the big picture stories, it's, it's some of these hidden gems that we have, like Dorchester Abbey um, and, um, you know, the Bucks Railway Museum. That's a fantastic hidden gem. You've got the carriage there where um, uh, pres- the, pres- the president signed um, a declaration during the oh, Second World War. Karen, I'm really... Uh, listen, my little boy would love that, but you, trying to sell it on, on... You've got a carriage that a president sat in and signed a bit of paper. It doesn't sound as sexy as, like, the Great Wall of China or uh, the well, Acropolis. Well, the Great Wall of China, and actually, you know, it's not a very... Well, it depends if you want to walk it. Are you going to diss the Great Wall of China as a tourist attraction? Karen! Not a Oh, you it's impressive. It's impressive. But you have to, you know, when you have expectations of a holiday in the South East, yep. you, you know, it's a different type of holiday. When you're going abroad, you're looking for something different. Yep. But I truly believe, and, I, you know, as I said, I've just spent a week on holiday in the UK. Mm. I don't arrange most days, but we had a fantastic time. We did activities. We did things like archery, horse riding, cycling. And those are all the things you can do where, you know, it's a, a different, as I, I keep saying, it's a different holiday. But we're really keen. We work out in China. Buckinghamshire works closely with us in another campaign, which is a, a near Europe trade campaign where we go out to Germany, Belgium, the Netherlands and France. Um, and so there's a lot of activity going on. And the legacy of 2012, we have never had so many PR visits. As we, mm. We're running about 40% up this year from journalists, international journalists that are interested in the South East. Well, Karen, listen, I wish you the best of luck. You're right, we need to get as many people as we can and spend their, their, their pounds and their yen and whatever else it may be. Thank you very much, Karen Roebuck, Head of Marketing for Tourism South East, which promotes Buckinghamshire. I, listen, my little boy would love a train museum. He'd love the Roald Ro- Dahl Museum. Of course he would, but... A fortnight in in Britain when you could go to I don't know France or Tokyo or San Francisco. Um, Jane's in Aylesbury. Good morning, Jane. Morning. Do you holiday abroad or in Britain? Oh, in Britain. Why? <laughs> well, believe it or not, we when me and my parents go away, we always have a good holiday. Always have a good week. The weather's great. The things we do are really inspiring. I mean, the last time we went, we went to, um, oh, can't... You can't even remember where you went, Jane. That's how memorable it, it was as a break. Two, it was two years ago. Right. I haven't been on holiday for two years. Um, but, but what did you do? What things did you do while you were on this British holiday? Well, I do my family history, so I'm going to old churches and... Cemeteries and things oh like that. Oh my goodness, that's true. <laughs> but that's the thing. And listen, Britain has got some fantastic old churches. It's got yes. some cemeteries as well, if yes. that's your thing. But it, that's it. It's old. It's old buildings that are a bit cold and a bit damp and a bit miserable. I that's know, Britain. I, I've been doing my family history for nearly forty years. Are you nearly finished? Uh, no, there's no chance. Right. Okay. I'm doing about 130 families. Oh blimey! Um, I'm doing my late husband's side as well as my parents' side. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm, I'm really quite busy with that. Um, OK, well, well, listen, Jane, I wish you the best of luck. Thank you for defending British holidays. I'm just moving on because, um, oh, dearie me, we've just had some, What about these abusive texts that have come through? Why are these put on my screen? We've been sent some abusive texts. I'm saying that cats are better than dogs. They obviously are. Phil says, 
Dogs are better for the simple reason they don't decimate the local wildlife because they're not left to roam free by selfish owners. Selfish owners, Philly, what are you talking about? Decimate the local wildlife. Martin, cats are vermin. If they were real animals, they would be included as an animal in the Road Traffic Act. Steve, I hate cats. Never trust something which licks its bum then wants a kiss. For goodness sakes. You're all wrong. Steve, Martin and Phil, you're banned. Across beds, hearts and bucks, this is Ian Lee on BBC Three Counties Radio. Good morning, 8.32, another 28 minutes or so of the show before Jonathan Vernon Smith comes in at nine o'clock. It's going to be a cracking show, as it always is. But coming up in the last half an hour of this show, why you might be killing your pet with kindness. And do you remember Uncle Reg from St Albans? Well, he, he was, um, he's done a lot of charity work, and his niece told us yesterday um, how she'd nominated him for an MBE, which is all very exciting. Jenna Benson went to Hertfordshire County Hall to meet him, and we'll find out more about that in just a little bit. We've been looking this morning for someone under the age of 65 who plays bingo. Sue in Linslade has uh, texted in. My 19-year-old niece and her 21-year-old boyfriend go to bingo regularly up north. Up north, yeah. My 18-year-old son stayed there for a week and went twice. He has a membership card now. And um, Andrew in Standon says, I play bingo and I've been playing for four years now and I'm 38. Well, Andrew, come on. Mid-30s. I even play short mat bowls and grass bowls. I love a bit of bowls. When bowls is on, crown green bowls, is it crown? No, not crown green. That's the, which is the one that's on that kind of long indoor bit? I like that. When that's on the telly, there's no better way to spend a Sunday afternoon watching that. It's so peaceful and it's so skillful. How do they do that? I do love uh, a bit of bowls. Now, you probably, if you've got pets, give them an occasional treat. We all do it from time to time. Well, you could be unknowingly harming them, because more than a third of UK dog owners, and it normally is dog owners, they fed their dogs toxic or harmful food, including milk, grapes, raisins and chocolate, not knowing that by treating their beloved pets to these types of food, they are putting their health at risk. Our reporter, Justin Dealey, is at uh, Bowness Veterinary Hospital in Barton Le Clay this morning. Uh, good morning, Justin. Morning, Ian. You've got a real problem with dog owners this morning, haven't you? Uh, and this sweeping statement yeah. that cats are more intelligent than dogs. Well, where's that are. come from? I- I'll tell you why, Justin. This is, uh, if, if you were to die in your mm. house, OK, on your own, and you had a dog, the dog would lay beside you until it died. <laughs> if you had a cat the cat would eat you. Oh, what a lovely if thought. so facto, cats are more intelligent. <laughs> Away you go. OK, thank you very much indeed. Uh, lots of people here inside uh, the clinic. One of those is Julia Bowness. We like the name, by the way, Bowness, having her own veterinary clinic. Um, uh, this report today is quite worrying. It talks about the amount of overweight dogs. A third of dogs are now overweight. Is that something that you're seeing here? I would say that's a very moderate estimate. So, quite clearly, we're just too nice, then? We are too nice to them. Um, I'm afraid our dogs suffer with the same 21st century problems, health-wise, that we do all ourselves, as well. So, let's talk about some of the no-nos, because dog owners may be feeding their dogs chocolate, for argument's sake, which could kill them. So, so what's a big no-no for a dog? Um, chocolate is toxic to dogs. It has to be given in quite a high quantity to be toxic. Um, and it's the really dark chocolate that's very toxic. The other thing that a lot of people don't realise is grapes and raisins are very toxic to dogs as well and quite often owners will give their dogs fruit because they think that's healthier than chocolate and obviously if it's a grape or a raisin it's not brilliant. So many people to speak to here I just want to bring in Cheryl Jameson. Cheryl welcome to the programme. You run a cat rescue charity and cats also a lot of them are overweight but the ones that you pick up clearly aren't because they have been mistreated. Do you think there needs to be more education about owning a pet such as a cat? Definitely. There should be a lot of research before you take on any cat or kitten. That It's not just taking on a little fluff ball that can just be independent and look after itself. You are responsible for that cat or kitten. I'll come back to Julia in just a second. Also going to bring John into the conversation. Hi. Morning, John. How are Morning. you, sir? I'm fine, thanks. Now, you're here with Gemma. Tell us more about Gemma. Well, Gemma's getting old now. She's 11 years old, but we usually get 14 years out of our retrievers, so we're quite comfortable with her. And you feed Gemma very well, don't you? We feed her, yeah. Just hard food. She's never on anything like the things you're talking about, yeah. chocolate or... So clearly a very educated owner. Why is Gemma here today? She's got a little bit of a urinary problem, so she's a little bit of a bladder problem, which we've been having her treatment for. Well, she looks gorgeous. <laughs> she <laughs> really, really does. <laughs> John, thanks for your time. OK, back to Julia, just finally on this one. Um, Ian's been saying this morning this sweeping statement that cats are more intelligent than dogs. Uh, you being the expert, is that true? Um, you can't really. It 
here's a sweeping statement. Um, cats have only been domesticated for about 4,000 years, so their interaction with humans is much less developed than dogs who've been in, in, who've been in domesticated for 9,000 years. So you can train dogs, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're more intelligent. Mm, and brushing their teeth, this report says today that, that, that dog owners should be brushing their teeth every single day. Do they really need to do it every single day? That's the gold standard and that's what you should aim to try to do. And um, there's a lovely video on YouTube from one of my clients with Mab and Maeve who both have their teeth brushed every night. The owner sits on, on the edge of the bath in her dressing gown cleaning her dog's teeth. It is amazing to watch. It's a fantastic place to be. Ian, yes, um, sir. just lastly on this, um, well, we have shown a photograph to Julia this morning of yourself. Uh, not only are you a radio Radio personality, uh, but you're also a television personality. Right. So a lot of people. Here, well, a lot of people would have seen you on television. So uh, I've shown the picture of you to Julia this morning. Yes. Um, what sort of dog would Ian Lee resemble? Well, I have to say, is I didn't have any backup on this, but I would say a chihuahua. A chihuahua. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. End of conversation. Go um, right off you, Julia. <laughs> so I like you. She's like, like spouting. How can you brush a teeth dog? I can't get my two-and-a-half-year-old son mm. to brush his teeth. You can't brush a dog's teeth every night. Well, apparently, according to Julia, you can do it. Is it quite easy to, to brush a dog's teeth? Because it sounds quite hard to me. It is, but it does take some training and perseverance and, you know, don't give up at the first attempt mm. and all my nurses are quite happy to show anybody who wants to know how to do it, they'll, they're quite happy to show them free of charge. I'll tell you something Justin mm. I, I, and I'm going to use potty mouth language so to listeners avert your ears <laughs> I, I once uh, for a period of a week had to um, uh, empty the anal glands of my cat <laughs> Having done that, Justin, I know, I apologise, it's true. Having done that, I think I could probably do anything now. I think you probably could too. Um, many thanks to Julia this morning, live here in Barton Leclerc at the Veterinary Hospital. And I think the problem is, Ian, we've mentioned it all morning, we are a nation of animal lovers. We, we love our animals so much in this country, and that is probably where the problem is. You're having your dinner, go on, have some of this, have some of that off my plate, have my yep. leftovers, and that's where the problems start. Education, education, and more education is needed. Justin, good message. Just drive back carefully, won't you, mate? Oh, I will do. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Justin Dealey there. Uh, it's true, I, I, I apologise. I had it with my cat. And, and really, once you've done that, you are capable of doing pretty much anything in life. I won't go into detail, but it's very unpleasant. Now, a man from St Albans has received an MBE for his services to charity. <clears throat> if you were listening to the show yesterday, you would have heard Anne Brown talking about why she nominated Reginald Law, her uncle Reg... Uh, for this award, and she was—it was wonderful to hear. She was so full of joy and excitement. Now, Reg was a little bit poorly, so he couldn't get all the way down to Buckingham Palace. So he went to Hertfordshire County Hall to get his uh, MBE yesterday, and we sent along our reporter Jenna Benson to meet Reg and see what happened as he received his award. Member of the British Empire, Civil Division, Reginald Law, Neighbourhood Watch activist for services to community safety in St Albans. I thought it was a very uh, straightforward ceremony, very nice, very nicely done, and um, something which uh, I was quite pleased to be at. I was in the back, in that corridor, and the citation was being read, and I was out there, you see, and not that my hearing is the the best of things at the best of times, but um, no, I didn't hear it. Well, they were able to read out a few of the things that you've done throughout your life. I don't think they'd have been able to fit everything in. I mean, otherwise, we'd have run extremely over time. But I know, I know. <laughs> for you, what has been the highlight of what you've done to help the community? The honest truth is the most, how can I put it, most enjoyable part of that, what I feel was the most practical part about it, is working for the British Red Cross. And the work that you've done with these organisations and other organisations in the community has got you to today, where you're proudly wearing your MBE on your lapel. How does it feel now to finally have that award? Yes, I'm very proud to be wearing that award, but I want it known, and I, I've expressed this feeling, and I do really mean it, that I could not be here without the fact that I have had in the past some wonderful teams working with me. It's, it's a matter of teamwork. And I've been lucky, I suppose, that I've managed to find the right team at the time I needed it. 
people who were cooperating with me and known what they were doing and went about them as their work in a in a splendid manner and between us we made what we we had, you know, what it was. And the person that nominated you for this award is your very, very proud niece. Anne, how do you feel today? You've been into the chamber and I saw as Reg was receiving his award you stood up i feel immensely proud it, it's been the end of a long journey it's it's something i wasn't sure i would succeed at it's it's a point of pride for me because i've succeeded as well in getting this mbe but nothing compared to what registered to deserve it i mean I, and he doesn't seem to recognize it but 73 years of voluntary service is not to be sneezed at and i, I think i think um he he needed something from the community um, to say thank you, you know, and that's what this is this is a, a national thank you isn't it? Fantastic, Jenna Benson our reporter there at Hertfordshire County Hall with Reginald Law MBE, excuse me and his niece Anne Brown. Another reason that cats are more intelligent, because you can't train them. Sorry, I'm just going, it just occurred to me when that vet was talking you train a dog, uh, beg fetch Roll over, play dead. Yeah, you can train them to do that. They go, yeah, 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 I'll do that. Oh, you want me to play? Oh, yeah, I pretend I'm dead. I want me to get that stick. Yeah, I'll get it. Oh, you want me to get the stick again? Oh, I'll get it. I want me to get the stick again? Oh, yeah, I'll get it. And cats look at you and go, I'm not getting a stick. What? what why would I get a stick? Get it yourself. I'm off. I'm upstairs. That's why they're more intelligent. Because they don't mess around and do as they're told. You can't boss a cat around. They are free spirits. And if they choose to come and sit with you and choose to come and live with you, that means that you are doing something right. I've, I do have kind of a thing against dog owners, because dog owners think they own all the fields and all the heaths and all the parks, walking around with their dogs. I'm walking my dog. Yeah, you've got to pick up your dog's poo. Never forget that. Never forget that. The cat berries. 08459 uh, 455 555 is the telephone number if you want to call in and defend your pet before the end of the show. There's another 15 minutes or so before Jonathan Vernon Smith comes in and does his thing. It's almost 8.45 exactly. It's Wednesday the 10th of October. These are your headlines this morning on BBC Three Counties Radio. The National Farmers Union is predicting food prices will rise after bad weather during the spring and summer led to a poor harvest. Members of the Sir Jimmy Savile Stoke Mandeville Trust will decide whether to keep the late DJ's name later this month when they meet to discuss the charity's future in the wake of child abuse allegations. In sport, the eagerly anticipated match between Rory McIlroy and Tiger Woods at the World Golf Final in Turkey may count for very little after both lost their opening matches yesterday at the Invitational Match Play event. Your weather across beds, hearts and bucks, a chilly, misty start, then fine and dry with sunny spells and a top temperature of 14 degrees. Coming up, bingo halls, they're dying out. Maybe it's because no one under 65 plays them. BBC Three Counties Radio. No one wants to holiday at home, do they? Do they? We've had a few people emailing in and, and saying I'm wrong on this, and I appreciate that. But I just, well, Visit Britain will today launch its biggest consultation yet to overhaul the tourism industry. It's trying to reach a new target of 40 million visitors by 2020. Kim Hallett is the Head of Sales and Marketing at Waddesdon Manor in Buckingham. She, she joins us now. Good morning, Kim. Good morning. You've seen a real increase in Chinese visitors in the last few months. How, how has that happened? We have, yeah. Well, we've been working very closely with Karen Roebuck at Tourism South East, who I think spoke earlier. You spoke to her earlier on, yes. And we've just started to see, we've been doing some work out there in China. They launched a Go Asia campaign quite a long time ago. And so we were there right at the start. So we've been doing some PR over there. And now, just, I suppose since the Olympics a bit, mm. we've started to see some groups, small groups coming. But also, I was talking to the ticket office guys the other day, and they were seeing a lot more individual Chinese coming in as well. So they'll be coming in cars or hopefully also in public transport from London. So it's all very exciting. Has there, there's obviously been a big, a big uh, uh, boost, I would imagine, on tourism because of 2012 and the Olympics. Is that going to last? do you think how, how do you sustain that i think what what visit britain are doing which is quite interesting is trying to get on the back of that enormous britain out there worldwide and so it's down to all of us um both as individual properties and then throughout the county to really keep that profile raised and the more that we can do that and shout about britain and that's people in the uk visiting as well as overseas people, that we've got to keep that momentum going. And that's the important thing. Be proud of what we've got. What is the appeal of places like Waddesdon to, to people coming from abroad? 
Well, I think I, as far as Walton is concerned, we've got this fantastic French chateau in the middle of the, the Chiltern Hills, which is stunning to look at. It's also got the Rothschild um, story behind it, and the Chinese love that uh, Rothschild banking dynasty story. They love to come and see that. They enjoy the wine that they can have at lunchtime, and they just love seeing such a beautiful house preserved. Uh, along with the gardens. Uh, who, who spends more in the gift shops, the British or, or, or foreign tourists? Um, I think it, it does tend to be the overseas tourists because mm. we've probably got a little bit more to offer. But having said that, we've had a very good year. Our spends um, are keeping up uh, against the atrocious weather we've had. So I think, you know, we're feeling quietly confident um, that we can keep this going. M- most of your business, I'd imagine, is still UK visitors, is that right? Absolutely, and they're hugely important to us. Mm. They're a good 80%, if not 90% of our business, and we've worked hard to keep the domestic um, tourists coming to us. We're probably an hour to an hour and a half is, is the distance that we've tracked of visitors coming to Wadston. Uh, Kim, listen, best of luck. I hope people keep coming th- through your doors. I'm sure they will. It's Kim Hallett is the head of sales uh, and marketing at Waddesdon Manor in Buckinghamshire. Um, and uh, the, the interesting having a huge influx of Chinese um, visitors coming over and, and, and visitors in Buckinghamshire. means that the work they are doing seems to be working. They seem to be attracting the right type of people, which is all very exciting. 08459 455 555 is the phone number to call me. Also the number to call Jonathan Vernon Smith at nine o'clock. He'll be talking about abusive uh, relationships and it should be a, a, a fascinating uh, listen. Now, bingo. We've been talking bingo all morning. I, I do like a bit of bingo, but it's an old biddy's game really, isn't it? If, if we're honest, it is. Uh, in the age of, you know, Xboxes and Playstations and, and YouTubes and going online and all the... Twitter, uh, the, the, the bingo just looks, it looks so old-fashioned. Well, in fi- the past five years, more than 100 bingo halls have shut. The Bingo Association say it's because they are unfairly taxed more than their online counterparts. Well, um, we earlier on, um, we sent out just a uh, reporter, Sophie Solaria, to find out whether you're interested in bingo or not. I, I think it's good fun. It's good fun to play. It's, it can be a laugh. You can win money for free as well on free sessions. And have you ever played online? No, I haven't played online. Because it defeats the point of playing bingo. Um, the whole point of playing is to get involved instead of just sitting at home in front of a computer. But then are you finding that there's a decrease in people coming to play or have you noticed it becoming more popular? I think it's becoming popular, especially with the younger people. How many people have you seen playing bingo in a bingo hall? Um, at this club, a few, couple of hundred, but at other clubs there's a plenty more. This is one of the smallest clubs, so... It's a lot of people. Yeah, definitely. And it's only getting bigger as well. Including younger people, not yeah. just old biddies. <laughs> it used to be older people, but now it's appealing to the younger people a lot more. Why do you think that is? Um, it's a chance to win money for nothing, really, and it's fun. Hi, madam. So, why do you come to bingo? Well, I don't like it staying indoors, and I, like, I enjoy it. I enjoy playing bingo. It's exciting when you, when you think you're going to win and you don't, but you don't expect to win all the time. Have you ever won? Oh, yeah, many times. About £1,000. Pound. I'm going back years ago on the tables. £1,000. Pound. Wow. Years and years ago. Do you ever play online? No. Are you finding less and less people are coming to bingo? Yeah. Really? Yeah, re- recently, yeah. Have you noticed many young people, though? Quite a lot, yeah. More so. You get crowds and crowds and coming sometimes, like hen nights and all that. But, um, yeah, I think look, more younger people come than ever now. I've been coming for donkey's years. Well, Mark Davis has worked for the online betting exchange Betfair. He's on the line now. Good morning, Mark. Good morning. Have you noticed more people choosing to gamble online than in traditional venues like bingo halls? <laughs> I think uh, the fact that the, the online industry has grown a lot over the last 10 years, I think is, uh, I think you'd have to be blind Freddy not to have seen that. Um, so, yes, is the short answer. Why is online gambling so popular? Oh, for a whole host of reasons. It's interactive, it's fun. Um, it, the, the options are, uh, you know, there are so many more options than you could have uh, traditionally. Um, it, it has, the industry has changed dramatically in the last decade, and um, you know, the number of products that have come um, into availability uh, has grown beyond all recognition. It's a bit sad and lonely, though, isn't it? Because I, I, every now and then, maybe a couple of times a year, I'll go to a casino and have a little go on, on the roulette. And it's nice because there's an atmosphere, it's, it's exciting, there's people jostling, you can get some food. To be sat at home in your pants, playing a bit of bingo or betting online, is there not something a little bit sad about that? 
Um, I think if you if you characterise it in those terms, then yes. But I think that's not really the way that people think about doing it. I mean, most people will gamble um, you know, while they're doing something else. They're watching television. In fact, yeah, increasingly, people today are gambling on their mobile phones and on their iPads rather than uh, online. So actually, you know, betting is moving mobile, really, rather than just online. Um, so I, you know, it's easy to characterise it as sitting by yourself in your underpants and socks. Um, and I think in that instance, yes, of course, it's very sad. But I don't think that's the experience of most people who do it. Uh, dangerous online gambling? You're saying it's easier to do it. It's more possible. You can do it anywhere now. Some people must abuse that and um, do badly out of it. Uh, people always abuse things. Unfortunately, almost anything that you look at in mm. the world, there is always going to be some small group of people that abuse it and unfortunately gambling is no different in that um the gambling industry has an obligation to protect those people um and i think does pretty well given um uh, if you look at the if you look at the prevalent studies that the government has done i think that uh, they are on top of that issue um yeah, the, the the bingo industry i think what it's struggling with is uh that it that it is not as attractive mm. to the younger demographic as you know, some of these more interactive things are. Having said which, you know, they also have got a, a really fundamental problem, which is that they are taxed more highly, and, and that, is, that is basically unfair on the industry. How, do, how does that work? Because why do you, the online, and I agree with you, I think it's more of a, a problem to do with the fact that people think it's, it's perceived as an old biddies game and that, that they've not really made any attempt to get younger people in. But a lot of people from the bingo industry have mentioned the tax thing. Why are online gambling sites tax less than bingo halls? Uh, good goodness knows, it's the most ridiculous right. thing ever. I mean, they, yeah, they used to be double taxed. They used to be taxed VAT as well as gambling tax. And then the government moved the VAT. But in doing so, they also put up the gambling tax rate to 22%. They've dropped it since to 20%. But every other gambling product is taxed at 15%. It's, it's basically unfair. Mm. Uh, and, you know, it ought to be moved. I've no idea why the government has decided to do it. Um, but you know, the, the, the bingo industry is out there lobbying to get that changed. I do think, though, as, as you said yourself, that they have more fundamental issues. Yeah. But you know, maybe we're wrong in that because you had people on your Vox Pop saying, you know, no, I'm young and I really enjoy it. Mark, ever and been, to a, it ever been to a bingo hall? Uh, no, I haven't. And I'm afraid I'm, I'm not likely to, I'm afraid. <laughs> Mark Davis, thank you very much. Mark Davis from Betfair. Uh, there. It, it does have an image problem, doesn't it? I think bingo. That's it. It's all blue rinses. And it, it, that's, that can be the problem. The age-old battle has been uh, raging this morning. Cats v. Dogs. Lynn's in Hemel. Lynn, are you a, a cat or a dog person? Oh, cat. You're a cat, cat person. Cat, cat, Of course. And welcome. Welcome. Why? Because they're so intelligent. Yeah. It's like you said, they, don't, they won't be trained. They act like they're doing you a favour living with you. Yeah. And I've got a kitty that... I mean, my last kitty, unfortunately, I tried to put down a week before it had been 20. Oh, 20? Yep. Flipping heck, Lynn. I know. I might have another well, seven years of my velvet. He was called Dizzy. Yeah. My latest cat called Roops I've had for about seven years. Yeah. And he does things like sometimes I have to be taken into hospital at short notice. Yes. And he's so clever... He has got three people he goes to. Oh, sneaky, for a bit of food. And they've told me this. Yeah. No, he goes to one for food. Yep. He goes to one because he knows they'll put a blanket out for him. Wonderful. He goes to another when he wants a cuddle. And they've all told me that. They said he's very crafty. He knows Little exactly tart. where to go. He's a tart cat. That's what he Mind is. You, what he does do sometimes is he pretends I'm in hospital. What? Just for extra food, but the other thing he does, which I think is really clever, yeah. is he knocks on the door when he wants to come in. Hang, hang on a minute, Lynn. How does how does he knock on the door? I'm not quite sure. There's a little wall outside my house, yeah, and he sits on it, yeah, and he just taps on the door. Wonderful. Hey, the best thing my cat does. She does two things. Okay, and this will sound a little bit perverse, but I love it. Sometimes she will sniff my eye with her nose, so her nose touches my eye, which I love, and sometimes she'll chew my hair. Does your cat do anything like that? 
Yeah, and he sleeps on my head. There we go. You see, sleeps... This is why cats are much more fun than dogs. Thank you, Lynn. Cat sniffs my eye. I love it. Final word um, goes to Deborah, talking about English holidays versus world holidays. English holidays are great. The beaches are brilliant for the kids, and there are plenty of lovely place to visit. places to visit. Who cares if it rains? Just put on a coat or get wet. It's only water. But Deborah, you don't want to get wet on holiday. And those beaches, let's be honest, I think we've conclusively proved this morning, A, I'm a better driver than Justin Dealey, B, holidaying in Britain, it has its ups and downs. C, cats are better than dogs. And D, only deviants have beards. I shall leave it on on that. Jonathan Bernard-Smith is up next. I'm back tomorrow at six. Ta-ta. Getting beds, hearts and bugs talking. This is BBC Three Counties Radio. Thank you, Ian.